Hi everyone, it's Elise from Kid and Clouder and I'm excited to introduce you to our free Woodlands Deer Coloring Class for Markers and Pencils. This class has been created as a special thank you for our community and class members for an amazing 2020 together. I'm so grateful for your support to help in keeping our classes, community and giveaways and free workshops for the Queensland Children's Hospital and Cancer Council running during this very difficult year. And I hope that you'll enjoy this special thank you from me. So let's chat about getting you set up to color. Now, as we're focusing on the techniques and theories here today, you're welcome to use any color blends or images with this lesson if you don't want to use the ones that I'll be using. What you are learning will transfer over. So you'll find the color blends and the free class image back on the classroom page. If you're coming here from YouTube, please view the video description for all the links to these resources below. If you don't have the same colors, please just use blends that you do own in your stash that follow the principles of a light source. Now, if you're new to coloring and you don't know what this means, head back over to our website, kidandclouder.com and check out our free color blend charts under the color blends tab. You'll also find more information on how to create blends under the coloring FAQs area. You're also more than welcome to email me anytime for assistance with blends with what you own. Now the way that this class works is that at the start of each chapter, I'll be breaking down all of these art theories, which are applicable to both markers and pencils. So it's really important to watch the start of each chapter, even though there'll be a little bit of talking, as this is your foundations lesson. These are the art theories and techniques that inform the why behind what we're doing here as we color. And then I'll break it down and show you both markers and pencils coloring separately. You can simply fast forward to whatever medium you're using. The videos are broken down into smaller chapters if you are on our classroom website. YouTube, you'll just see the whole thing. But if you want it broken down, just again, check out those links below for that. Now, by using smaller chapters, it helps you establish mini goals. So you can choose to do as much or as little as you like at a time without feeling overwhelmed or like you need to sit for long periods. Most people only squeeze in say 15 to 20 minutes at a time. So it's more than okay to take small little amounts for your self care and to level up your work. So please don't feel like you need hours of free time to learn more about coloring before you start. And please don't feel like as well, you need to watch the whole video before you jump in too, if you are time poor. I know some people like to do this, but it can double the length it takes you to do a class. So pause and rewind are your best friends and such a big benefit of doing an online class versus a live class. When you do a live class, you're at the pace of everyone else in the room. So it's a very quick, very overwhelming when you are learning quite in depth technique like this. So definitely use these resources that are available. Now, if you are new to our classes, I always do free private tutoring one-on-one -on -one with you to help with personalized tips on your actual coloring as well. So even though this is a free class, I'm more than happy to extend this to you today. This isn't done in our Facebook group or publicly. Uh, the Facebook group, if you remember there, it's just for sharing and support with others learning like you. So always encouraging comments to get you feeling motivated and confident. But if you'd like some tips on how to continue to level up, please pop me an email or a message on Facebook Messenger and we can work direct. So if you're stuck on something, feeling like a technique isn't working, or even just feeling a little nervous getting started, then please reach out and we can do as much together as you like. Now, I know I've been chatting a lot already, but I just have one more important thing that I want to chat on before we get started. So if you are new to our classes or you have come across this video on YouTube, this is a proper educational lesson rather than a quick how-to video. So we're going to be going over real art fundamentals and theories to help you start learning the foundations to be able to color your images after this class. So I want you to treat this lesson here today as an exercise rather than being about creating a perfectly finished project. It's better to try to challenge yourself to make mistakes and learn from these lessons than to strive for everything to be perfect or identical to mine or anyone else's you may see doing the same lesson. We all have different amounts of background experience. And the point here today is simply just to try new things. And if you learn one new tip or refine one skill you already have, then you've succeeded and leveled up today. So don't waste time or energy on feeling like you need to be an instant pro as no one ever is. You're not going to master everything here today. And if you were probably not going to teach you a whole lot. 
So just remember, you don't have to be great to start, but you do have to start to be great. So I really want you to remember this. So before we even do anything, I want you to write now, write the word practice on your page for me. You can write it off to the side. You can still use your image at the end. Just pop it somewhere so that whenever you may feel frustrated, disappointment, or even that perfectionism sort of creeping up behind you, look at that word practice and remind yourself that that's all it is. No time or effort is ever wasted doing a practice as it doesn't matter what your coloring looks like at the end of this lesson here today. What matters is if you've taken the steps to challenge yourself to try these new things and to take those steps to continue growing forward. And lastly, if you love this class, I would really love if you would consider sharing about it with your crafty friends on your blogs, Pinterest, wherever you would like to spread the word. My mission is to help people feel confident with their coloring while actually learning a proper base knowledge of art fundamentals. So you can constantly look to level up and be proud of what you're creating, whether you started yesterday or started, say, three years ago. The hardest part is reaching people who may like to join in. So if you think someone may benefit from this freebie, I'd love your help to spread the word. So I think that's enough from me. How about we jump in and get ready to color? We're going to be starting with chapter one here first, where we're going to be doing the grass and the leaves. Welcome to chapter one of the video tutorial. In this chapter, we're going to start with coloring the leaves and the grass here today. Now I'm going to run through some of the art theories behind coloring the leaves before we jump in. So please watch this part of the video regardless of what medium you're using. Now the number one thing to help you achieve depth and realism in your coloring is understanding what light source is and how it works. So light source is the number one thing you should learn if you're starting out with coloring. As without light, we can't actually see an object's form. Now light source can be a little bit tricky to understand though. It does take time and practice, but the only way to learn it is simply by having a go, jumping in, getting a little bit thrown in the deep end and going over these theories. It's important to always be learning light source. So even when you step away from the class, grab out the booklet again, or even flip on this part of the video, just to remind you of some of these techniques and tips that we're going over, because it doesn't just sink in at the first go you have. I always like to liken it to um, like learning at school, like maths, for example. You know, when you learn uh, mathematics, they teach you the problem in class and it's tricky, it's complicated. You do some practices and then you go home and you have homework. And with that homework, you're expected to get out your textbook again and kind of go over the theory and the problem. And then you troubleshoot and you problem solve and you try like different um scenarios with that same math problem. So that's the same no matter what skill in the world you're trying to learn. It doesn't mean it's too tricky to do. It simply means it's going to require a little bit of practice and a little bit of repetition to go back over what you've learned before it really sinks in and becomes just everyday common part of your coloring technique. Okay, so let's get started on that. Here's a quick rundown of the basics on light source for you. So please take a watch at this next part of the video. And if you would like more information about light source, also check out our free Markers 101 class back over on the website at kidandclatter.com. There's a big uh, section there on light source and how we tackle that in our classes. And even if you are a pencils user, this is great for you as well. Now, when we color anything at all, we need to be thinking about some art fundamentals that help inform our decisions in our coloring. Now, one of the most important art fundamentals that you will learn is the light source. And it's tricky to learn it at the start because it's a true art technique that not a lot of us really know about until we're taught it. But basically, whenever we're coloring an object, we need to imagine that light is illuminating the scene. So there's sun up in the sky or there's lights in the ceiling and they shine down rays of light that hit the objects in our scene and illuminate them. Wherever those rays of light come down and hit first, they are our brightest areas and we call them our highlights. And we show these using our lightest colors. The opposite of this is our shadow. So they're the darkest areas and the part that the light hits last. So we represent these with our darker markers. 
Now, in between highlight and shadow, we have midtone. Now, midtone is generally considered the true color of an object as it's neither affected by light or shade. So that's a really good way of picking color blends as well. You can always start out with what you think the midtone color is going to be and then picking markers lighter for your highlight and markers darker for your shadow. If you'd like to learn more about color theory and how we pick the colors to suit this, pop over to our website, kiddingclatter.com and click on classrooms, then markers 101. It's a free class there that goes through color blends and how we choose them to work with light source and more light source instruction as well. But one of the most important things that we need to look at is cast shadow. Now I've popped a pen over my hand here and can you see the shadow that's on my hand? That's our cast shadow. It's a shadow that's cast by an object in front or above, which is my pen, onto an object below or behind, which is my hand. And what this does is it actually shows distance between objects. So the closer my objects are together, the darker and harder the shadows are here. Then the further apart they get, the lighter and more dispersed our shadows become. So you can see utilizing car shadows in our scene is very important to help to show different depth and levels in what we're seeing in a scene. So we're going to have areas that pop out towards us and areas that look like they're sitting further back. Don't worry if it sounds a little bit too overwhelming. We're going to be learning a lot about it today. And if you would like more of that basic instruction again, feel free to pop over to our website and head to that Markers 101 class. We will break it down even further for you into those real basic fundamentals. Now we're going to be getting ready to move to chapter one of our coloring video here today. And we're firstly going to be working on skin tones. Okay, so now that you've learned these light source basics, let's touch on how we would apply that to this image here, and in particular, our leaves and the grass. So starting on the leaves, we wanna think about the form of the object and how we wanna portray that. Before I do anything, I wanna think about what parts of this leaf here is popping out toward me? What parts are further back? Now we work with ambient lighting here today and ambient lighting is like a big cone of light, like the sun in the sky, you lights up in the ceiling and it casts such a big cone of light over the whole area. So what you'll find is that both sides of an image will end up being illuminated or in shadow based on what's actually happening with the objects. You may have watched videos before where say, the light comes down on one side and say everything on this side's light and everything on this side's dark because it's further from the light. So that's more of a really basic understanding of how light source works. We're notching it up a level here now so you, to help you create even more depth with your coloring. Something like this is more like directional lighting. So like spotlights, a torch, things like that where you actually are shining the light rays in a particular direction. So we wouldn't usually use that with normal portraiture or images like this where we want the whole thing to be illuminated. So ambient lighting with this big cone of light, what happens is as the light rays come down over the object, the parts that are raised up toward you are going to be the highest parts of the object. And when the highest parts are up, the light rays come down and hit them first. So anything that's raised is going to appear lighter to our eye. And then the opposite of that, anything that's lower down, so a lower level there, is going to appear darker to our eye. And that will be the form shadow of the object. So we want to always be thinking about what's actually happening with these objects. What's popping towards us? What's further back down? That's the first thing you can do no matter what image it is you pick up. Pick one object to start with and go, okay, this tiny little object, what's actually happening on the page? And we can do that with our leaves to make them nice and easy to tackle. So if I look here, what I'm trying to show is that the sides of the leaf are curving slightly. So you've got here the sides curving away from my eye, whereas the middle of the leaf here popping out. So I've got the middle popping towards me and the sides sort of curve around a little bit. So the way that I show this is that middle part that's popping out, it's going to be lighter. And you can see straight through the middle how I do have that lighter color. Now on those sides, it gets darker where I'm showing that rounded edge. 
You'll also notice at the top a little bit of a darker color here too. Just because an object's at the top, it doesn't mean it's lighter where the light's coming down and hitting. It depends again on what's actually happening with that object. So what I'm trying to show here is that there's a dip in the middle of this leaf. So where I have that little dip, I'm imagining it like a concave sort of shape. And because that's happening, that little bit in the middle is further down from the light from these two bits. And I'm also imagining it curving over. So instead of just stopping, I'm thinking about it in terms of three dimension, how that's curving over in, in on itself. So I'm going to add a little bit of my darker color here to show that movement as well. On the other leaves, we do the same thing. I've got it lighter in the middle, showing where it's popping up toward me. A little bit darker on the sides where it's curving away. Now in that light source video you'll notice that I touched on cast shadow so remember cast shadow when something is in front of something else it casts a shadow on that object behind showing the levels between. Now if I'm going to be coloring the leaves I want to look firstly at what is sitting in front of these leaves where are the levels happening and I can see automatically that this deer is standing straight in front of those leaves. So right where the deer is, we're going to add that cast shadow directly behind on the leaves there. So you can see darker straight behind him to show those levels. So you have cast shadows, which is when we have an object in front or above another object, it casts a shadow on the object below or behind. Then we have form shadows. Now the form shadows are where the object itself is curving away from the light, such as the side of the leaf. Now again, if you're brand new to light source, this might feel overwhelming and that is more than okay. It's information overload when you start. Like, you know, when you start a new job and they give you all that information, you think, how am I ever going to remember this? But you do. It's going over, it's repetition, it's asking questions when you're stuck. The more we go over something and try your lessons and keep practicing the technique, the easier it gets, I promise you. And when we get coloring shortly, it's going to make a lot more sense as well. Now the last little thing I just want to touch on before we get started on coloring is I've got the grass here. Now I've got it a little bit darker at the back and as we come toward us it's just getting a little bit lighter there. And you will notice though underneath the hoofs of the deer that I do have a darker color there. And that again is another form of cast shadow. Because the deer is standing on top of the grass he's going to be casting a shadow back onto the grass below. So we're always thinking about, firstly, what parts of an object are popping up towards us, which are further back, and secondly, what objects are standing in front or above other objects to create the car shadows and the overlaps. Okay, so this is all going to make a lot more sense once I start coloring. So let's just go in and have some fun. I'll be showing you markers and pencils separately so you can fast forward to whatever part of the video you'd like to watch with your medium. Welcome to the pencils portion of the video tutorial. Now you should have watched the start of this video where we go through all the art fundamentals and theories for how we're going to be coloring up these leaves and grass. If you haven't, please do go back and watch them just so you understand the why behind what we're doing here today. Before we jump in, I'm just going to run you through a basic pencil blending video. So this is going to run through some tips and tricks on getting some really nice smooth blends with your pencils. If you've watched this before, I recommend to still watch it again as it's going to give you that really great foundation before we come to coloring our image. So when we color with our pencils, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is paper. So it's really important that we have a good drawing paper when we're coloring with the pencils. Drawing paper generally has what we call a tooth. So tooth is like a printed texture into the paper and that texture grips and holds the pigment. That's what allows you to layer and blend up so you're getting complex blends and allows you to keep the colors smooth. Now, the paper that I'm using here today is Mitont by Canson. There are many different brands that are available. We do have a big write-up on those on our website as well. You can head to kidandclatter.com, click FAQs, then coloring FAQs, and you'll see papers there. Now the paper I'm using, if you're using the same one I am today, please make sure that you're using the right side. This is one of the only dual-sided papers on the market. 
So you may feel that your paper is dual sided because it's got a texture side and the other side smooth, but that's not actually dual sided. It's only just been printed on one side and the rest is just the standard paper. Whereas this one has two different textures. So the side I'm printing on is a little bit softer. The other side, the way you can tell is this side here. Notice it's got these little bumps all over there, like little circles. We call that the honeycomb print. Now that's for holding chalks and pastels and more heavy media like this. So we tend not to use the side. It takes a lot longer to blend out because the tooth is bigger to hold that different type of material. So I'm using the reverse side here. So if you are using the Miton paper, just make sure you've got it on that right side. If you're using a different drawing paper, you'll want that textured side so you can grip the pigment. Now, if you are using a smooth paper here today, that's okay. It's all practice and you're still going to be going over the techniques and it's still going to help you learn, but it's going to be a little harder to blend smooth. Your key here today is to go really slow and really soft as you build up the colors. That's going to help you gain a little bit more control. So no matter what paper you're using though, pencil work is all about going slow and soft with the blending. It's important to always keep your pencils nice and sharp. That gives you control and allows you to push the pigment down the page. And it's all about blending in really little soft layers. So we just build the pencil up over and over with multiple layers and strokes. And you can see the more layers I add, it grips into the paper and I'm slowly flattening that paper down. It's really important as you're blending though to be aware of the size of your strokes. If you're finding it hard to blend your paper smooth, if you're, if you're new to using paper with a tooth, it's probably because your strokes are too big at this point. So we want to make sure our strokes are only really small and I even like to use small circles to push the paper flat as I blend. Keeping that pencil sharp really does help with that as well. Now, instead of coming in with a hard texture and pressing it all flat straight away, the reason why we go soft is it allows us to build up those blends. So if I come in here nice and softly with one color, you can see I'm not placing any pressure down, but then I'm able to come back over with the next color and continue to blend out. Notice I've got no lines between my colors here. And then it's all about going back, building up the layers so you've got the control. Obviously we use a few more colors in this here today, but you can see the idea I'm slowly filling in the tooth, having control over my blend and getting those transitions nice and flat. Now what you may find when you're starting out with pencils, it's normal to be a little heavy handed. Now I'll just show you what happens if we're a little bit too heavy handed. If we come in here and we lay down our color, Notice how my color is ending in a straight hard line there. Now, as I come over to blend, what happens? You can see that line in between the colors. I haven't blended them smooth. That's because there was just too much pressure and I flattened down the tooth and the page too quickly. That means that there's no grip left for any more pigment. So I wasn't able to get that smooth. That's why we want to always focus on going nice and slow and soft so we do have that control over the duration of the blend. However, here's a little trick to help today. This is one that I have made up called fuzzing up the edge, technical term. So if you come in and you're a little heavy handed and you find you've got that line, it's not ruined. What I want you to do to focus on here is come back in really nice and slow and soft and come back over your edges here to fade them out. And I just go over the top to soften down. You can hold the pencil further back as well. That'll allow you to place less pressure on the pencil. And then once you've flattened that down, just make sure that the next color you come in with is nice and soft. And then you should be able to come back here, nice small little circles to blend. And you can see we're able to get those transitions smoother. 
So that's a good little tip to keep in mind today as you blend. Going back over, fuzzing up any edges that look a little bit too hard, but making sure overall that you're patient with your pencil coloring. It's about slow, soft layers for control. It's not a race to finish here today. Enjoy being in the moment to create that finished piece. Now one last thing before we jump in, one tool that I'm going to be using here today that you're going to see is our Kid and Cloud Pencil Dusters. Now every so often you're going to see me just wiping the page off like this, removing any of the dust that falls from my pencil. Now the reason why this is important is if you're not constantly removing those little bits of pigment that are falling off, you can accidentally push them down into the page and smudge the pigment in. It'll give you a dirty look and you'll get little speckles all over your coloring. So you can use uh, many different things to do this. I used to use a feather because it was really soft, like a little emu or ostrich feather, and just brush away the pigment with this. The problem that I had with them is they kept breaking all over our page. So what I actually did when a lot of people requested what to use, I actually had these dusters made up for us. So I've actually picked the bristles that we use on these so they are super, super soft. They're softer than most of the art brushes and makeup brushes that are out there as well to make sure that you're not pushing the pigment down because you do have to be careful when you're brushing away that you're not using force, which is encouraging that pigment to grip into the tooth of the paper. But you can use whatever you have on hand. Just be really gentle. If you did want to check out our dusters, though, we do have a few left over in our shop. They do have free worldwide shipping as well. Okay, I think we're ready to jump in with our coloring here today. All right, welcome back. Let's move this off and let's get started. Now I've got my olive green pencil and I'm going to apply this straight to the form shadows. So we talked about on this leaf here, where the side of the leaf was curving away from the light. So I'm just applying it straight through in those areas. Now I'm making sure to apply thickly. I don't want super thin lines. Thickness is going to be easier to blend and it will give me a little bit more depth as well. And I'm applying it very softly. Remember, pencils is all about soft pressure. I've got a little cast shadow here behind the legs because my deer is sitting straight in front of that leaf. So I've applied a little cast shadow behind. Now over here in between the legs, we've got these two leaves. Now I can see that the leg here comes straight over the top of these lines. So the leg is sitting in front of those leaves. So we can do our cast shadows here, just following up and again, add a little bit of thickness. You can also come behind there as well. Now you'll notice one other thing is this leaf here is overlapping this one. So we can now see that we've got a level between these two leaves overlapping. Now if you ever get confused about cast shadow, pop a pencil over your hand and remind yourself whatever's in front, cast the shadow on the object behind or below. So with this leaf being in front, the cast shadow is going to come directly underneath it onto that leaf that's behind. I've got a little bit peeking out over here as well. So I'm just making sure that as I do my shading here today, the colors all end nice and soft. If you have any hard line, remember to come back over as absolutely soft as you can so you can fuzzy up that edge and get that nice natural fade out of the color. That's what's going to help us blend more seamlessly with the next color in the blend. Okay, now once you've done that, let's continue to blend out. So my next color is Kelly Green. And all I do is I come straight over the top of the olive green and I'm just extending a little further. Now I'm making sure that my pressure is still really nice and soft as I lay these colors down. This is going to help me eliminate any lines between the colors. What you may notice though is I've got quite a lot of white speckles showing through my coloring. This is the tooth of the paper. It's okay to actually have that tooth showing because what it means, anytime you have the white speckles, it means that your paper can hold more pigment. It means I can continue to level up the color. 
I can continue to work on getting it smooth and I can add more colors to create a more complicated blend. As soon as I get rid of that tooth, I can't really do a whole lot. So we want to make sure we're not getting rid of it until we're happy with how the blend looks and the smoothness as well. So never be frustrated if you see that. You'll learn some tips today on how we can flatten it further for you and a little bit quicker. But if you've done some coloring before and you've had that tooth left over, that is absolutely okay. It's going to actually help you get more depth in your pencils coloring. Now, some of you may have used Gamsol before with your coloring or odorless mineral spirits. It's just another way of blending, but it does break down this pigment into like a paint-like or marker-like surface. You actually will lose a little bit of control and vibrancy doing it that way. I mean, it's personal choice. Uh, sap green light is next and we're just repeating here. But with your um, the solvents, it, it actually typically isn't an art artist used medium for things like this. Typically an artist would use it for like a background or an area that's really quite large and they want to really quickly flatten the tooth in the paper. So for smaller things like this, you just get so much more control and flexibility to use just your pencils yourself. But Craft has sort of jumped on it only fairly recently in the last couple of years. Just because um, I think a few influential crafters started using it as a way to quickly get smooth blends. Because like I said, it's used for smoothing out large areas like backgrounds. But the problem we kind of have with these small images is we really don't need it. If we're using the right papers and a really good blending technique like we're going through today, you'll be able to get your blends even smoother than using solvents and even more depth control and detail. But of course, absolutely your personal preference. If you want to use it today, you'd still do the class exactly the same, except when you get to the end where I start to layer up, you can just use your solvents instead. Pale Sage is next, and I'm just continuing through. So you can see not too tricky at this point. Once I've got my shadows and everything mapped in, that's the hardest bit. And then I can just continue down through the blend going from dark to light and I'm blending into the lighter areas. So I like to start in my shadows because like I mentioned to you before, it's very easy to see where your shadows are going to go. You can map these in and slowly work toward those lighter parts. Okay, so that's one full round of the blend. Now I want my highlights to really pop out, give me a little bit more contrast, which is going to help those lighter areas look even more raised up. So I grab my white pencil and I just come through the middle area or anything that's uncolored and I'm just shading back and over where the green has just ended. So you should be able to brighten the highlight and also merge any uncolored parts with where the greens have ended there. Now take your time and do small little circles. The key to getting your blending smooth as we come through and do the later layers, which we're just about to do now, is not increasing the pressure on the pencil, but it's actually about decreasing the size of your stroke. So you can see there, one full round of the blend, we can see the light source very clearly, but we've got all those white speckles through. So let's get rid of them by repeating everything. And again, this is olive green. The idea here is not to increase our pressure, but to just do a smaller little circle, which will target the tooth and help it to stay flat. The reason why we want to keep our pressure really soft on the pencil is this is what's going to get the blend smooth between the colors. So if you use too much pressure here, you'll start to see those lines between the colors again. So, Try to be aware of it. It does take a little bit of practice if you're new. And especially I think if you're a marker user, we're so used to just the standard amount of pressure that we use in our projects. But you just want to reel that back a lot. So just be aware of how hard you're holding the pencil. It should never be like a death grip, like you're really holding it so hard that your hands are hurting. It should just be nice and soft and just smaller strokes to build everything up. 
Now a sharp pencil is going to be easier to get your detailing done and especially any edging done, especially when you get to smaller objects. So running the pencil through a sharpener now and then is going to really help you get those crisp edges. I use a battery sharpener which helps to take pressure off the pencil and reduce any breakage as well. There's so many different types really, pretty much all of them are, are good to use. I've never really experienced any troubles with the Artist brand battery sharpeners. I have had people complain about eating pencils, things like that. The thing is, I think it's a bit of an optical illusion. We take the same amount of the wood casing off whether we're turning a sharpener or the battery sharpener is turning the sharpener. It's just that it will feel a little bit faster and you'll see the pencil go, go down because you're holding it and pushing it in. But it only really takes as many turns as it takes for the pencil to become sharp. So you don't have to worry too much about, um, about how it's using the pencil. Okay, Kelly Green is next, and again the same thing. So I'm just running this straight over that previous color that I've used, and I'm just blending it in. Now make sure as you color you don't have any hard edges. If you do, just run the pencil very lightly over them just to take away any of that hardness so it'll blend softly. If you find you're still struggling with the pressure, another good tip is to hold the pencil further back from the end. The further back you hold it, the less pressure you can physically lay on the pencil. So it may help you just to practice really softening that down. We'll try that when we do our, our background shortly as well because that requires a very soft fade out on the pencils. But in all honesty, I find that people start probably 90% of the time too hard and the other 10% of people start too light <laughs> and they've got so much tooth left it takes them like five or six layers to really build it up. So if you're either end of the spectrum it doesn't matter. The more you actually do the easier that's going to get for you. So that green light is next. So it's just about learning to control the medium and the pencils. So it's the same for markers and pencils. They all have a learning curve. If you've done one before and you're just starting the other, it's totally normal for you to feel like one's going to be easier than the other. It doesn't mean the other one's not worth learning or that you're not capable. It just means that you're learning. You're learning that control. It's just going to take you a little bit of practice. And if you're not quite sure what you may be doing wrong, but you feel like something's not quite right, This is the time when it's important to take a quick photo and take two minutes just to send an email over and we can work on what is or isn't working for you with some free private tutoring. And that'll just help you feel more confident going forward. Pale Sage is next, straight over the top. And again, you're extending in toward that center. You don't need to come the whole way over the middle. You can leave a little bit uncolored so you get that brighter pop where our white is going to go. And then you can bring that white straight through that highlight area. Okay, now that's the leaves done. You can see we have so much depth and dimension in them. Now, this is, of course, a more um, cutesy sort of image style. It's not very realistic looking, so we're not aiming for these to look like all natural leaves that you see in the garden that are all photorealistic. Every style of image has a style of coloring that'll suit it. So the amount of photorealism you do just depends obviously on how detailed the image is and what sort of style you want to portray. When you're learning about coloring, it's a really good idea to do all different styles, all different images, all different techniques, all different topics, even if they're not your personal favorites. Because when we just stick with what we know, we tend to pigeonhole ourselves and we take away our ability to continue learning and continue leveling up because we stick with what's comfortable and we end up just repeating similar projects. So if you're someone that, say, doesn't like fantasy, your goal should be to try a fantasy image. If you're someone who's scared of doing florals, you have to do a florals image because it's those challenges that actually will get you to level up. And it's the same here as well. I mean, this is a really fun, cute image. 
change. But if you've been too scared to try realistic, it's time now to do it. So we're learning here today just some basic techniques, not some really realistic photo quality techniques, but you know, everything you're learning has its place and is applicable whether you do realistic, cute, fantasy, animal or character images. So these skills are always transferable and you're always leveling up that work. Okay, next color that I'm using here is I'm just grabbing that olive green and I've just sharpened it up. I'm just doing a few lines through each leaf and I'm going to leave a gap. Each line is following the shape of the leaf around as well. So what's happening in that outline. It's just a little extra detail, so the leaves will look a bit more like leaves in this comical style. Okay, now while we have these colors, let's go ahead and do the greenery in our flowers. This is going to be quite quick, but we're going to keep the same sort of theory that we just went over. I'm going to keep the middle of the stem nice and light like it's popping out toward us and the sides are going to be a bit darker where it's curving away. Where the stem uh, sort of curls in toward the flower too, I am going to add the darker color in there. So we're showing a little bit of a shadow like the stem is sort of meeting in the middle like this. And you can even see when I hold my hands together like that, that there's not really a lot of light between them and it does appear darker. So we can use that as a little bit of detail. I always like to look at what's happening in the edge of the object. Anytime you have like a little hump extending in toward the middle of the object, Think about what's actually happening. It wouldn't have a little hump in the outline without something pulling it in, without some sort of interior detail. So you can see here, I'm coming around these humps and I'm pulling in like a little bit of a triangular shape to show the movement that's happening. I'm also adding little cast shadows underneath any flowers that may be sitting on top as well. So we can start getting a little bit of those levels happening. Unless shadows are really important as you do this, you can add the depth. And then as I come up where the stem starts to get straight, I'm going to apply to those sides there so I can show the sides of these straight stems which are curving away. Now, as the stems start to get horizontal like this, what you'll notice here is that I've added the color to the bottom of each of these little horizontal prongs. The reason for that is my light's coming from above, so it usually will hit that top sort of side first, and the bottom side I want to show is further away and rounding down. So they're quite a small little detail, so not adding a lot of color and having the directional light like that will make it a little bit easier to see what's happening. Now remember, a little bit of thickness can help you get even more depth in your work. So I'm just coming around each of these so they're not just fine lines. We very rarely actually want fine lines in our coloring, whether you're a markers user or a pencils user. There's often a common misconception about how fine your detail work should really be. It shouldn't really be as absolute fine as you can because those sort of lines lack a lot of depth. Right, next color, Kelly Green. 
And now you can just come straight over the top of what we've just done and start to blend that a little further out. So these areas are a lot smaller than the leaves we did previously. Good rule of thumb is to try and use each color equally. This will make sure that your highlight, midtone, and shadow are always represented equally on the page. And when you have ambient lighting like your sun or the lights in the sky, that's usually how it should be represented, just as equal amounts for each component of light source. Next color is my sap green light and again just the same thing so we're just continuing to blend out. As these areas are a lot smaller you may find that your coverage is a little bit better than they were on the bigger leaves so like with mine here I don't feel like I'm going to need two layers I can probably smash this out just in one but again I'm pretty comfortable with using my pencils so my amount of pressure I use on different parts of the image just comes from my experience with using them. So if you get to the end and you think, hmm, I've still got quite a bit of tooth left and she's not doing a second layer, you can just come through and do it. Just press pause on the video and just continue layering until you are happy with that result. We all color a little bit differently. So sometimes you're going to need more than I do. Sometimes you may even need less. There's absolutely nothing wrong with how long it takes you or how many layers. Personally, if it's taking you like six layers, it's taking too long. So that's the only time that I would tell you to, you know, maybe look at changing something, increasing that pressure a little bit, getting a bit more control there because it's just going to take you too long and you end up going to get, going to get frustrated. It's okay while, um, while you're learning for it not to be, this is our pale sage, for you to still need a little bit of time to get that control. But if you are still doing, say, five or six layers after some time, we want to look at just getting you to use a little bit more pressure. And you can bring your white pencil through just to brighten any areas that need it through there as well in your highlight. I especially like to come through like that middle section and you can see you can just brighten that through so that whole part looks like it's popping forward. Now we're almost finished with this chapter. I just want to do the grass quickly at the bottom. I'm going to use the same blend, but I'm going to introduce Lime Peel. Now, Lime Peel is a more yellow-green based color. And by introducing this color to the blend, I'm just going to change the tone slightly. So my whole blend will end up a little bit more yellow-green. So this allows me to add another layer of interest into my piece because I've got quite a few green elements. There's not a whole lot of color here today, but when I do have repeating elements that are the same color family, it can be a nice idea to just slightly change up the tone so you get a little bit more visual interest. So you can see it's not that hard to do, but it really injects a bit more depth into the coloring. I'm not going to go over color theory a lot in this lesson. We go through it a lot in our monthly classes. You get so much information on what tone is and how to adjust colors and everything. So if you do want to learn more, make sure you check out the other classes and that'll help you with how to create blends and how to start feeling confident um, adjusting things like this. But I'm just going to start with my olive green. I'm just coming along the top and again, just very lightly. You don't need to use... Um, a lot of pressure here. We want to make sure we avoid any straight lines. Now we did talk about doing little cast shadow underneath him. So what I've done is I've just drawn around the bottom here 
and then I'm going to extend out a little bit of shading to the sides. By drawing under the bottom, I give myself a nice outline where this hoof ends, and then my shadow should usually be horizontal with the line of the horizon. I'm just making sure I keep that there. And you'll notice as well, the shadow goes back behind the hooves a little bit too. It's not straight underneath. This is because my character isn't 2D. He's not just flat. We want to think about the fact that these go backwards from what our eye can see right now. They have dimension. And because of that, the shadow is coming around the whole depth of the foot, not just the front bit underneath. All right, next color that I'm going to be using is a little bit of Kelly Green. And all we're doing is we're just blending out. So come back over the previous color and extend along the bottom a little bit further. And you'll see here, if it connects up with around the hooves, it connects up. So I'm just applying the same amount in each section. It doesn't need to connect up perfectly yet, but I'm just gradually getting lighter and lower. All right, next color, Lime Peel. So this is where we introduce this different color tone. Now I want to make sure I'm coming back over my previous colors, so I'm toning them with a little bit more of this yellow as well, and then extend further down. This way I keep all the depth in the colors I've used previously, but I'm able just to tone them out a little bit, especially as I get toward this mid-tone area. Make sure that you're still applying lightly so you don't have lines between the colors. If you are seeing lines between any of the colors, it means we might have used just a bit too much pressure. So you can grab the pencil of the line that's too dark or hard, and you just really softly come over the edge just like this, and you'll be able to take that edge away, and then you can continue back and around. My next color is my sap green light. And again, I'm just coming over and extending softly below. Again, make sure you're not using too much pressure. And you'll notice as I come across here, the colors are starting to just match up. And I like when I do like the bottom of grass like this, it's just a really simple grass technique. We're not really getting textured, but I don't want it to be all straight. So allow yourself to get a little bit of a wave and a curve at the bottom there. It'll look a little bit more natural for you. In my pale sage. Now this color is a lot lighter, so I'm not bringing it the whole way back at the top this time. I'm just coming over the previous color and extending a little further down the page. Where this color ends, it's the same thing. Make sure you don't really see a line. So you just want to come as absolutely soft as you can over that edge, and you should be able to fade the edge out.
you can bring in your white pencil as well and I start just off the edge and circle back and over the edge. So you're basically blending that edge into the paper and that can help you get that fade out as well. So that's one full round of the blend. Got a little bit of tooth showing so you can repeat the previous steps or you can use a blender pencil. Now the blender pencil is just the core of the pencil but without any colored pigment. So because of this, it's a little stronger and it helps to essentially push around what's already on the page. You want to make sure you have a good amount of pigment laid down. Otherwise, it's not going to push well. It's going to be scratchy. It's not going to be smooth. But if you have a good amount of pigment and coverage down, but you just have a few little bits of tooth showing, you can use your blender to help you push it flat. So you just start in the shadow area. And I'm just doing small little circles, just the same way I would do my normal blend and coming back and over the color. Now it's not adding any color because it's colorless. So just remember that you're just pushing around what's on the paper. So I don't use this all the time because of course, like I just explained, because you're pushing stuff around, it does compromise the smoothness. But on something like this where I just it's just the grass, a little bit of texture can actually enhance the effect. It works really nicely just to finish it all off quickly for you. And again, if you don't have the blender, you can simply just repeat your techniques from before. You can finish with a few little blades of grass if you like. This is of course optional, but I just grab my olive green and I just go sort of side to side, all different lengths. All different heights there in different directions and I'm just adding a few little blades in quickly so it looks natural just sort of flicking the marker around there and you can even do a little bit of lime peel as well a little bit of variation rather than keeping it all the same color some strokes might sit on top some will sit beside just a little bit of variation Okay, and that is our first chapter there all done. I'm just zooming out. So that technique, this little grounding technique, can be applied underneath any character, any animal, any character image. All you need to do is you create the rough line of the outline there, just like we uh, colored over earlier, and then you do your cast shadow beneath your character like we've just done. Now, remember, this is your first time trying this technique. And when we try new things, we can often have mistakes in areas we don't love. It's totally normal. Before looking at your work, I want you to do something really important, and that's change your perspective. When we're coloring, we color from about 10 or 20 centimeters away. We color so up close, focusing on every single little detail, every mistake, every single little aspect. But that's not actually how coloring is viewed. Think about whenever you're online, you see someone else's work. Do you sit so close and scrutinize looking for mistakes? No, you look at the whole thing. You appreciate it in entirety, how the techniques have come together. That's what we want to do here as well. So to help you change your perspective, what I would encourage you to do is hop up out of your chair, do some hand stretches, just open and close your hands a few times. Make sure you're not getting any RSI from holding those pencils. Neck gently from side to side. And even do a lap walking around the room just to loosen up. Then when you come back, hold your coloring out at arm's distance or prop it up against the wall and take a few steps back. You're changing that perspective, viewing it as a whole and seeing how it's coming together. Make sure you do those things so you actually get up and do your stretches. It helps so much rather than just holding it back and looking. So when you're looking at your whole piece, remember if there's areas you don't love Instead of saying I've done this wrong or it's not perfect, really don't like when people say that. Try and always avoid it, especially if you're sharing online as well. What I want you to do instead is look at your piece and say, any areas you don't love, think of the lesson here. Next time I'm going to do this to get this result. And see all of a sudden you change negative into positive into constructive. It's your learning opportunity. And that's exactly what we're here to do today. So experiment, have fun with it. You're doing a great job. I'm really excited to see how you're going. Pop in and share your coloring after this step with us. Pop it in our Facebook group. Pop it on Instagram, your blogs, any other group. You're welcome to share any way you like. 
All I love is that you please just mention that you're learning at Kid and Clouder so others can come and learn with us as well. I'd love if you mentioned what class it is. But you are working hard. You are challenging yourself. You're pushing yourself. That deserves to be celebrated. So again, give yourself a big pat on the back. You've done the most important thing to help you grow your coloring here today. Welcome to the markers portion of the video tutorial. Now you should have watched the start of this video where we go through all the theories and fundamentals for how we're going to be coloring up this chapter. Please do go back and watch it if you haven't yet. I know it's a little bit of talking, but it's actually the why behind how we're going to be doing our coloring here today. Now before we jump in, I'm just going to run you through a quick marker basics blending video. This video is going to teach you some tips and tricks for using your markers and all of those basics before we jump into our final image. Even if you have watched this before, I still highly recommend to watch it again as it's going to help you with that underlying foundation for how to use your markers before we get started here today. Okay, now with markers, I'm using my Copics here today. Now it's important when using alcohol markers that you use a good bleed proof cardstock. Now I'm using Expressit Blending Card. There are a few other types available as well, which you can find on the website, kidandcloud.com. Click FAQs, then Coloring FAQs, then you'll see the papers section with suggestions there. Now the reason why we use a bleed proof cardstock is it allows the ink to sit on the surface of the paper for longer rather than seeping through those fibers of the paper. This is what allows us to blend the colors together and allows us to work them a bit more. The reason why I like the Expressit is I find it tends to hold more layers of ink for longer, allowing the ink to sort of sit on the surface for a bit longer. Now, if you're brand new to using markers, what I would suggest, if you have difficulty with any of the strokes here today, that you pop onto our website, again, kiddingclatter.com, click Classrooms at the top of the page, and then scroll down to the free Markers 101 class. Now, this class runs through all of your marker fundamentals. Okay, so you can use any colors at all if you like, um, if you're going to color along with me. I'm just using my B12, 14, and 16, so a good blend to show highlight, midtone, and shadow. Now, when we do a coloring with our markers, the main stroke that we're going to use is feathering. So I don't really use circle blending in our classes, and that's because if you've learned circle blending before, what happens is if you've got your dark, middle, and light colors, and you're circling, you can actually muddy everything up. So when we work with light source, I tend to use more feathering method. Now feathering is when we come, we'll come parallel with the page. Now I'm holding the marker like I just would normal writing. So it's a little bit on its side rather than straight up and down. Now you may notice I'm holding the marker so it rests on my second last finger. A lot of people color with it on the last one. And when you color on the last one, what you'll notice here is I'm very close to the page. So as soon as I put my hand down, I'm sort of hitting the page already, whereas if I've got it on my second one here, when I come down to place the marker, I've got a bit more of a gap. My marker is sitting high from the page and I have a bit more control. Now, if you usually color like this, you may find that it just takes a little bit of practice to get comfortable on this one. You may find it doesn't work for you at all and that's okay, but I have had a lot of feedback that it's helped with fine lines. So have a practice today, see how you go, and maybe something that helps. So when we do the feathering, we're going to come parallel with the page and we lift our wrist at the end of the stroke. And that gives me a nice fine finish to help with blending. I want to use the side of the marker so I get nice big broad coverage. And you can see I'm overlapping so I get again that broad coverage there. I'm trying not to have much um, individual stroke like this showing at the end. So you can see here I've got pretty good coverage. I'm just lifting as I finish up. Then I grab my next lightest color. So this is B14 for me. And I start just back of where I've ended with that color. And then I just do the same thing. So I feather straight over the top and extend further out. And I keep going until I can't see the line between the colors any further. Now I can see, however, the line of where I started this color. So once I've finished this, I just go back real quick. One layer should get rid of that line. So the idea with markers is that you keep blending until the lines disappear. And that's what your bleed proof cardstock helps with. So next color B12, same thing. You just start back a little bit. 
building up. Remember, use the side of that marker, nice big broad strokes. Keep going until that line disappears. When it does, if you can see where you started the color, just go back one nice stroke over the top until you're happy with the blend through. And that's all there is to it. So you wanna make sure we're not getting these little stubby sort of strokes here. If you are, use a bit more of the side. And try and work quickly. I find when we work quickly and we're a little bit more carefree, it's a lot easier to blend with the markers. We're not as heavy handed. We don't need to think it through every little step. Okay, ready to go. I'm going to pop this off to the side and I'm going to grab my darkest color, which is going to be my YG67. Now, if your markers are brand new, I'd encourage you to uncap both sides of the markers because you may find that a lot of ink comes out on the newer markers. Uh, and we can actually encourage a little bit of alcohol evaporation, nothing that's going to make your markers dry out, but it's going to prevent the blobs and drips of ink that you may have seen on your page. So I know some of you have encountered this before, uncapping both ends is going to prevent that. They're not going to dry up on you at all, just for this project. So I'm just coming in and I'm going to apply my YG67 to my form shadow areas and any cast shadows. So I'm coming up the side of the leaf here first and through that little middle part. Now you can see I'm working with little lines here as I work. However, I don't need my marker to be super, super fine. My lines to be super fine. A little bit of depth is going to actually help them blend out a little easier. So don't worry too much about how thick or thin your lines are at this point. I feel like people get very caught up on how thick or thin the lines are um, and sometimes they overdo it a little bit. A little bit of thickness gives you depth. We don't need fine lines to do basic blending like this. Coming on these other leaves between the legs, so we want to have a look at that cast shadow, remember? So the deer here, his legs sitting right in front of those leaves. Remember when something is sitting in front of something else, the object behind gets the shadow on it. So I'm just going to come up and do a nice thick line behind those legs. Now I do encounter something else here though. I have an overlap of the lines here. So what this is indicating to me is that this leaf here is sitting in front of this one below it. So again, remember when we have something sitting in front or above, the cast shadow goes on the object below. So I'm going to come straight underneath here to add in that cast shadow. And that's going to help me get that little bit more dimension. Put another leaf at the back, the same thing, adding in those car shadows behind the deer's legs. And up the side here, this one as well, the form shadows where this leaf is curving around. You'll notice my lines are not particularly neat. Again, we're not working on a fine line texture here. We're working on just a blend. So we don't need our lines to be super fine. We don't need everything to be super neat. Alcohol markers works by overlapping the alcohol and using the alcohol to dilute the color down. So we just come over this and we continue adding more color and alcohol to the page to soften everything out. And that's why your lines, when you're working on the basic lens, don't always need to be perfectly smooth or straight. All right, next color that I'm going to be using is YG63. Now I've capped up my YG67. So you don't need to leave them uncapped for the whole project. I just thought I'd give you that little tip. If you find your marker is overly full, it can help. And I usually just cap mine after I use them. So YG63, and what I'm doing is multiple strokes over where that YG67's ended. So I'm going over and over with my multiple layers to get it all nice and smooth. Now, you want to make sure that you are using good bleed proof cardstock here because that's what holds all of those extra layers of ink. Not all cardstock is made equal and you don't really want to be using just a standard card because what happens is, is that's when the color bleeds out of the lines and that's when you find that the ink doesn't really blend on the page as well. It still has those lines between and looks quite heavy. There are all different papers you can use though. I'm using Express It Blending Card here today. It's just my personal preference. And I do have a write-up on a whole bunch of different types on our website under the Coloring FAQs page. 
basically it just helps the ink to stay on the surface of the paper for longer rather than seeping through. So we can do these layers and building like I am here. Now in some of these finer sections, I'm trying to work on the tip of my marker so I can still be able to see some of those line works there. So it's a little bit tighter. If you have um, trouble with this, what I used to do was literally get a page of blending card and just practice my stroke control. So I hold the marker nice and close to the nib and I hold the marker upright. And you would have seen I was just dabbing the very tip onto the end there. It's not a flicking motion. We're not doing hair or any of that sort of texture here today. I was just trying to get little lines. So by getting my little lines, I was just overlapping tiny little lines like that. They essentially look like this but all on top of each other to get my final line. So don't worry about doing your big flicks or anything yet. We'll come back to that technique when we do our deer. But I was just doing my little basic blending in these smaller areas by just dabbing the tip of the marker on the page. Now you'll notice I hold my marker resting on the second last finger. Some people hold it resting on the last one. Now. I mean, it's completely up to you how you want to hold your marker, but a lot of people have said that this has helped them. When you hold the marker resting on the final one, what happens is as you go to put this on the page, it's so close to the paper. So as soon as I put my hand down, I'm smudging the marker in. If I lift it up one on the second last finger, if I move my hand close to the paper, I'm not even touching the paper yet. So I've automatically lifted that marker up so I have that control to physically move my hand and just touch the tip down. So that's just something you can work on. I know it might feel uncomfortable at first. Um, the feedback has been though that with practice that's going to help you get a final line. But of course that's just one way to do things. And the next color I'm going to be using YG61. So I'm just coming straight over the top of where that last color has ended, multiple strokes again, blending out those lines, and then we'll come through the center. Now what you'll notice when you do your blending, the first time around I, I do my blend, it may look desaturated. So what that means is my lighter color basically is coming over the top of those darker ones. And because it is quite light and I am adding more alcohol, I've diluted down what's on the page. So the dark colors lose a little bit of pigment. And sometimes you can still see the lines between the colors. To combat this, we repeat everything again. So this just helps us to build up a little bit more color depth, adds a little bit more alcohol to the page as well. So it gives you a smoother blend. Now you know, you'll notice I'm working dark to light here today. Some people teach light to dark. There's nothing in it. In the end result, it's going to end up the same. The reason why I teach you dark to light is because when we go through all this light source theory and detailing that we're doing, it's easier to pick out those shadows first, add them in, and you can work um, backwards from those shadow areas, but also you end up using a lot less ink, especially when you need to come back over things repeatedly to get it smooth. So this is going to be a more economical way in the long run. So let's grab our darkest color again. We're just going to repeat everything to build up that little bit more depth. So I've got YG67 and it's, it is literally just repeating. If you find that you've got a lot of highlight showing through, with the second round, you have the opportunity to increase the amount of colors used. Notice I'm doing a feathering technique here to get it all nice and smooth and to add a little bit of depth. We don't need fine lines. Again, a bit of thickness is going to help you really get the depth in your projects here. But if you are doing flicking, and we will a little bit later on the deer, it's just something that comes with time and practice. It's a control thing. So just like anything, if you have any other hobbies or skills, sports that you may have done, you would know the first time you try it, it's a little clumsy. Even walking, the first time you tried to walk, you fell down. That's just because you don't have the control there yet. There's nothing wrong with not having control. There's nothing wrong with it taking time to master. It will come if you keep practicing it. All right, YG63, and again, straight over the top, multiple strokes, and you should see that line of the color underneath soften. As soon as it softens, I can move out to my next 
area. And the next color, YG61. And we just again do the same thing, multiple layers through that central area, blending it all together. Okay, now that's the leaves done. You can see we have so much depth and dimension in them. Now, this is, of course, a more um, cutesy sort of image style. It's not very realistic looking, so we're not aiming for these to look like full natural leaves that you see in the garden that are all photorealistic. Every style of image has a style of coloring that'll suit it. So the amount of photorealism you do just depends obviously on how detailed the image is and what sort of style you want to portray. When you're learning about coloring, it's a really good idea to do all different styles, all different images, all different techniques, all different topics, even if they're not your personal favorites. Because when we just stick with what we know, we tend to pigeonhole ourselves and we take away our ability to continue learning and continue leveling up because we stick with what's comfortable and we end up just repeating similar projects. So if you're someone that, say, doesn't like fantasy, your goal should be to try a fantasy image. If you're someone who's scared of doing florals, you have to do a florals image because it's those challenges that actually will get you to level up. And it's the same here as well. I mean, this is a really fun, cute image, but if you've been too scared to try realistic, it's time now to do it. So we're learning here today just some basic techniques, not some really realistic photo quality techniques, but you know, everything you're learning has its place and is applicable, whether you do realistic, cute, fantasy, animal or character images. So these skills are always transferable and you're always leveling up that work. So I'm going to grab the YG67. Now this is a fine line. It is of course optional. If you are worried about your project, you can use a fine liner or even a dark green pencil for this step. But basically let's practice on the side. All I'm aiming to do is hold that marker close to the nib and I'm dragging the marker. So rather than drawing like where I push it down, think about dragging your hand back and forth. So if I drag my hand, I get these beautiful fine lines. So I'm not actually drawing with the marker at all. I'm just moving my hand back and forth. So that's what I'd be doing on this project. So I'm just coming up and I'm just working quickly and just getting that drag through. So I'm not even directioning anything with my actual marker. And you can come over the top again if you like as well. And see how now adding that little bit of texture detail just breaks it up a little bit too. Okay, now while we have these colors, let's go ahead and do the greenery in our flowers. This is going to be quite quick, but we're going to keep the same sort of theory that we just went over. I'm going to keep the middle of the stem nice and light like it's popping out toward us and the sides are going to be a bit darker where it's curving away. Where the stem uh, sort of curls in toward the flower too, I am going to add the darker color in there. So we're showing a little bit of a shadow like the stem is sort of meeting in the middle like this. And you can even see when I hold my hands together like that, that there's not really a lot of light between them and it does appear darker. So we can use that as a little bit of detail. I always like to look at what's happening in the edge of the object. Anytime you have like a little hump extending in toward the middle of the object, Think about what's actually happening. It wouldn't have a little hump in the outline without something pulling it in, without some sort of interior detail. So you can see here, I'm coming around these humps and I'm pulling in like a little bit of a triangular shape to show the movement that's happening. I'm also adding little cast shadows underneath any flowers that may be sitting on top as well. So we can start getting a little bit of those levels happening. So with the YG67, I'm just coming straight where those little dips are and my cast shadows as well. 
Now with this color, because it is smaller, again, I'm not really coloring and drawing into the paper. What I'm doing is just dabbing the tip of the marker along the surface. So try not to focus too much on pushing the marker into the paper or feeling like you need a fine line. I'm literally just dabbing the marker there, I'm not really drawing a fine line at all. It's all about just how you're holding and controlling that marker. And you know what? If at the end of the day you don't have that control and the whole area ends up green, it's such a small area that it's not going to be a big deal with the finished project. So I think sometimes we get so caught up on our coloring needing to look like the teachers of the video that we don't actually realize that if it doesn't quite get there, it's still going to look good. You're still learning the theories. You're still challenging yourself. You're still getting that control practice in. It just means that it's going to look a little different than mine does. It means you've got something to practice. It means it's your own project. So don't be worried at all if these just end up all green and you don't quite get the depth there today. It is just something that you can simply work toward. YG63 is next and we're just going to blend into the highlight areas. Now this is something as well, you'll notice I'm using the no lines image here today, so the one with the lighter gray outline. The reason why this is so helpful is because in these small areas, you may go out of the lines. And the thing is, if you use the light gray version, no one is going to know. So you can effectively start to create your own outlines here. And that's going to um, take off a little bit of pressure with your fine lines. So sometimes I have people say they don't want to do fine lines because they think it'll be harder. The technique for coloring is exactly the same. Nothing at all changes. Um, it just means that if you go out of your line, no one's going to see that dark black edge. The reason why people like the no lines is because in real life, things aren't outlined. So it just gives you that softer finish and it relies on light source uh, to create the form of the object. But I'm teaching you that in every lesson anyway. So I think maybe for people who've never learned how light works they think oh how do I actually color this but it's exactly what you learn with or without the black lines in class. YG61 and I'm just coming straight over the previous and then through my highlight areas. Now you can Repeat this as well if you want a little bit of extra depth. We all color a little bit differently. So you may need more layers or less layers than I do. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you may get to the end, you go, that's fine. I'm happy just to leave it. Sometimes you get to the end, you go, I've really lost my darker colors there. My shadows are so soft. So you want to come in then and really repeat everything and build it up. That choice is totally up to you. You can always pause the video, repeat the step again. I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to come down now into the grass at the bottom though. Now with the blend here, I'm changing it up a little bit. I'm going to use those same base colors I just used, but I'm going to introduce two new ones. That's YG25 and YG23. And you'll notice that these colors have a yellow green tone to them. So by adding these into the mid-tone area of the blend, what that means is I'm able to change the overall tone, but it still will be pretty similar to this blend here that I used on the leaves. This means I know that the colors will work together very nicely, but I'm able to add a little bit more visual interest. Because I don't have a lot of colors that I'm using here on the paper, because I have repeating green elements, I tried to think about how I could inject a little bit more interest to the piece. And this is such an easy way that you can do it on any one of your coloring images. Say you have flowers and you have multiple roses and you want them all to be pink. Instead of just doing the same pink blend over and over, think about changing the pink tone up on some of the flowers. It's still within the pink family, but the slight shifts in color really register different details with your eye. So it can be a great way to add visual interest. So now this is just going to be a basic blend. So this should be nice and easy for you after those little details. So we're going to start with YG67. We're just going to come along the top. Now you can make that nice and thick. 
Now we're also going to come around the hooves here. Now you can see I'm just drawing around the bottom. That just gives me a nice crisp edge there that I can work with. It's like a base. And then I want my cast shadow to come out horizontally. So your cast shadow is always in line with the horizon. You'll notice that the shadow comes behind the hooves a little bit. So it's not just straight underneath, it's actually continuing back. This is because our deer isn't flat. We're starting to think of him in terms of three dimension. So these hooves here aren't just a flat piece of paper. We're imagining them rounded with a lot of depth. So because it's not just the front part that's on the ground, it's this whole area that's on the ground. So the shadow would be extending the whole way back. And this is what we see by doing the shading around the side there is we're creating that little pop of shadow showing that the object is three dimensional. All right, the next color that I'm gonna be using is a little bit of YG63. So we just start to soften out these olive tones a little bit before we come in and add that yellow green. Now where the colors start to meet up, you can extend them in so the shape starts to join. And we're just going to get lighter toward us at the bottom of the page. Just a really nice, simple grounding technique. And this can be done underneath any of your character or animal images as well. All you need to do is just draw in this rough squiggly line behind them. And notice it's further back from where the legs are. So don't just draw it underneath the legs, extend it back for the same reasons I mentioned before. Your character is three dimensional. No more thinking about characters as being flat from now on. So any ground always goes back further than just where the feet end. All right, let's brighten that blend. I've got YG25. Now with this color, I want to come the whole way back and that's allowing me to tone the colors that are already there. So you may be wondering why I went from YG63 to YG25, bit of a tricky jump there with my markers and that's because I want to darken those colors at the back without losing that depth. So it goes beyond the convention, just a little touch because we're, we're blending for color rather than blending from light to dark. So that's the thing, you don't always add markers to get you from A to B, from light to dark or dark to light. Sometimes you add markers to influence the tone of the color that you're using. Just like if you were say mixing paints and adding different ones in to create the new blends. So try to think of that with your colors as well. There's a lot of color theory on the website. If you're new to that and you're not sure how to make blends, Copic actually have a specific system, which I find really strange because so many people on YouTube or blogs are like, just do this with your markers and add these two colors. And you think, why, why do it that way when Copic have actually made this easy for you? There's a, a formula you can use and it follows these rules of light source that we're using here today. And it's just so much easier for you guys just to have that knowledge and understanding for the system on how the markers work. Some people say, oh, beginner blend, we'll just use two markers. There's no such thing as a beginner blend. Learn it from the start. Give yourself that chance to understand those art fundamentals and grow. It's not going to be tricky for long if you're practicing it. YG23 next, just getting lighter toward the bottom of the page. So you can head on our website for that information as well. Just go to kidandcloud.com, click coloring FAQs, and you'll see a big write-up. There's also a free class called Markers 101. Now that goes through all the fundamentals, like how you do different strokes, slide source, create blends, etc., as well. And this has all that information in there with exercise sheets too. So if it is something you really struggle with, that's going to help you get more of an underlying foundation for how to do it. Notice that most of these colors have joined now at the bottom as they've extended further down. And notice as well that my line isn't straight. I've got a bit of natural curve there, which is really nice because it just looks a bit more natural. YG61 is next. And I'm just coming underneath. You can see I'm just going over the line of that color underneath first. And you can wave that background as well, like wave it so it's not straight. And then I just blend up quickly to get rid of any lines. And then it should have that really nice fade at the bottom. Now, if you're using bullet tip markers and you find it hard to get good coverage there, 
Don't forget the chisel end on the other end of your marker. The whole point of this is for doing large areas as well. So you can always come through on the chisel end and just do the same blending that we just did above. So if I grab this now and just come along the edge, it's the exact same blending technique for me. So it's a little bit easier for you if you are struggling with using your bullet tips for large coverage areas. Now I am gonna add a few blades of grass. To do this, we're gonna work just quickly on our fine lines. You can practice this on the bottom of the page as well. So what I do again is I hold the marker nice and close to the nib and I hold the marker upright. So I'm working on that point. And what I'm aiming to do is I'm aiming just to flick the wrist. So you can see here flicking my wrist back and forth because all I want is that very, very tip of the marker to just graze the paper and create that little flick. And I'll just be doing all different lengths and I'm slightly curving the stroke to either side. Now, it just requires letting go and relaxing when you do this technique. The reason why I see people struggle with this is they go, oh, I got it, I got it. And they come to the image and they go, I don't want to wreck everything. And so they go really slow and they push the marker down and they're doing it like this. And you can see where the marker gets pushed into the paper because you get that little bobble and then you get a little flick like this. So I want you to relax the pressure. Get your hands now, shake them out, and hold the marker just really loosely. And just flick. Flick without purpose or without pressure or anything. That's all it is. Don't push the marker in or draw into the paper because that's when it starts getting thick. You can do this with a lighter color if you are a little bit nervous first. So you could even try your YG61 and just see how you go. But I just grab my YG67 here and I'm just doing a few. So it's not perfect by any means. It's a little messy, which is part of the charm of the technique. And I'm going back and forth there. And you can grab a little bit of, say, YG25. So we've got a little bit of variation. And I'm just doing it in those same areas. I'm not really worrying about what the colors are underneath some uh, lines will sit on top some will sit beside doesn't really matter too much it's just giving you that little bit of variation and that is the first chapter all finished up I'm just zooming out so that technique this little grounding technique can be applied underneath any character any animal any character image all you need to do is you create the rough line of the outline there just like we uh, colored over earlier and then you do your cast shadow beneath your character like we've just done. Now remember this is your first time trying this technique and when we try new things we can often have mistakes in areas we don't love. It's totally normal. Before looking at your work I want you to do something really important and that's change your perspective. When we're coloring, we color from about 10 or 20 centimeters away. We color so up close, focusing on every single little detail, every mistake, every single little aspect. But that's not actually how coloring is viewed. Think about whenever you're online, you see someone else's work. Do you sit so close and scrutinize looking for mistakes? No, you look at the whole thing. You appreciate it in entirety, how the techniques have come together. That's what we want to do here as well. So to help you change your perspective, what I would encourage you to do is hop up out of your chair, do some hand stretches, just open and close your hands a few times, make sure you're not getting any RSI from holding those pencils, neck gently from side to side, and even do a lap walking around the room just to loosen up. Then when you come back, hold your coloring out at arm's distance or prop it up against the wall and take a few steps back. You're changing that perspective, viewing it as a whole and seeing how it's coming together. Make sure you do those things that you actually get up and do your stretches. It helps so much rather than just holding it back and looking. So when you're looking at your whole piece, remember if there's areas you don't love, instead of saying I've done this wrong or it's not perfect, really don't like when people say that. Try and always avoid it, especially if you're sharing online as well. What I want you to do instead is look at your piece and say, any areas you don't love, think of the lesson here. Next time, I'm going to do this to get this result. And see, all of a sudden, you change negative into positive into constructive. It's your learning opportunity. And that's exactly what we're here to do today. 
So experiment, have fun with it. You're doing a great job. I'm really excited to see how you're going. Pop in and share your coloring after this step with us. Pop it in our Facebook group. Pop it on Instagram, your blogs, any other group. You're welcome to share any way you like. All I love is that you please just mention that you're learning at Kid and Clouder so others can come and learn with us as well. I'd love if you mention what class it is. But you are working hard. You are challenging yourself. You're pushing yourself. That deserves to be celebrated. So again, give yourself a big pat on the back. You've done the most important thing to help you grow your coloring here today. Welcome to chapter two of the video tutorial. And in this chapter, we're going to be easing back and actually doing our sky. Now, the reason why I'm jumping to this technique is we're going to be using a lot of the basic blending techniques that we did in the last part of the tutorial here. So I'm basically getting you to build up your technique with each chapter. And this is how I do our monthly classes as well. So they can look a little bit scary if you've seen our monthly classes, but they are absolutely suitable for beginners. And I break them down just as easy as I have here today for you. So we always go each tiny little detail back to the absolute basics. And with every chapter I do, I'm building on what you've just learned. So there's definitely a method to the way that things are taught for you here. This makes it a lot less overwhelming and easier to tackle as well, rather than just throwing you in the deep end with each technique. We start easy, we tend to build up as we go along and we draw on what we've already been learning the whole way throughout. So if you have wanted to try one of our other classes, please don't ever feel nervous by the level of detail that's involved. The whole point with the monthly class is just like this here today. It's to give you as many techniques as I can in the one project so you can learn to enhance your skills for your favorite images after class. It's just a project like this here today. It's nothing to do with the colors, nothing to do with the image style. It's just the fact that it's the exercise to learn those techniques on. And sometimes I have people say, oh, there's so many techniques I feel scared. The reason why is to give you better value for your money. So rather than just doing something so simple, like even like this here today, we're going through a lot of technique. But if it was just super simple like this every month, you wouldn't be getting a lot of value for your money that you are paying because you wouldn't be learning that many new skills. This way in the class, I try to think about different things we haven't done, different things that you can repeat to get practice that might be a little harder. And you're going over and over those skills so you can actually learn and improve your work. And the more techniques I can get in there, the more you actually get for what you've paid. And the class prices are so economical in value as well. You get I mean, it's cheaper than going to the movies and you get something that's probably longer than most movies and with a lot of skill and, and education in there to help you learn that. So just remember, if you've ever felt nervous to try a coloring class or you've got one, you're like, oh, I'm a little bit scared to jump in or you haven't bought one yet for those reasons, that just remember, it's just an educational lesson like we're doing here today. It's to help you level up and grow, not to be overwhelming. When you actually get started, it's so much easier than you think it's going to be. And really, it doesn't matter what you produce by the end of the class. It's the fact that you have tried those new things and challenged yourself and pushed yourself to level up because that's why you purchase a class in the first place. You don't purchase it because you know everything that's being taught. That'd be a complete waste of your money. You're purchasing it because you're wanting to learn, because you want that education, because you want to be good at your coloring and have that confidence and be proud of what you're creating. So don't be nervous. The whole point is it is a tool to help you level up. No one is judging. Even today, no one is judging what you've made on the page. So why would you judge yourself? No one is standing there telling you, you must do this level quality work. It's a test and you're going to get great at this amount. No, put that aside. We don't need that pressure here today when we do our art. We are simply showing up to do something for our own personal self-care, to take a mindful break, which we'll talk about shortly as well. And that mindful break helps you just to stop thinking about all those other stresses in life and focus on doing something for you. Focus on something unrelated, something with a challenge, something with a push, so you yourself can have something to work toward that isn't one of those stresses in life. So let's leave all of that stress and pressure behind. 
So in this basic background here today, you'll notice it's deeper in toward my character and it softly fades out as I get further out. This technique can be done with any color. It can be done behind any character or object image. You can do it like I've done here. I've connected it to the grass and it sort of fades out around. Or if you've got a character standing up, you could do just a circle just behind them rather than doing around the whole thing. So um, I don't have any images here, but imagine if this was like a girl and you had a head up here and her legs down here. You could just do a small circle through the middle. It doesn't need to be an all encompassing background. I really like this soft halo effect because it doesn't take away from the character that's in the middle. So it is a really good technique to master and to apply with all different colors. Now I'm going to show you some tips and tricks on how to do this with your markers and pencils. So let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, welcome to the pencils portion of the video tutorial. Make sure you've watched the start of this chapter where we go through how we're going to be coloring this up here today. It's really important that you do that just to help you understand what we're going to be doing with each chapter. I'm just going to move this off to the side and I'm starting with my blue slate. I'm going to come in nice and close to my deer here. Now I want to make sure wherever I add this color because it is the darker color in the blend that we are keeping that nice halo around a color that everything is sort of extending to the same point. You can map this in before you really even get started. So what you can do is say we wanted to run about here. We can so lightly map in those extents so we know how far to bring our color up. I can use the actual image as a guide as well. So notice that I've come just about a third through the ear there. That's a really good way to help you if you have trouble seeing how far colors should go. Use the actual image as a guide, like a, almost like a grid system, you know, where you could say, okay, I'm extending to the third grid over there. You can go, okay, I'm extending up to the second flower over there. It's just those little guides help to make a little bit more visual sense if it is something that you struggle with. Now, remember when we do coloring, the key to getting it smooth with pencils is soft, soft pressure. So you want to try and make sure that you are avoiding that softer pressure. Because we want fairly good coverage in the background here, I am coming over this area a couple of times to help get it a little bit smoother. I'm not increasing my pressure, so again, you shouldn't be holding uh, your pencil too hard that your hand is hurting or anything like that. That's just too much. But I'm just making sure to work in small circles. I'll come in between each of the little flowers here. Make sure you don't accidentally color over any of the little flowers. I've done that a lot of times. And remember, we don't need to get it 100% smooth because we can always use that blender to save you a little bit on your pencil. Coming in around the side. So remember again, it's like a little circle. So you could even just really lightly sort of draw how far you want that to come. Only if you're comfy with being soft though. And what you can do, remember if you struggle with being soft, hold the pencil further back from the tip. That's going to help you really get um, less pressure on that pencil. But where the color ends, always, always no pressure. Just really lightly do that edge. I like to keep the darker colors in and toward the image rather than coming uh, like out the whole way. So I keep it more toward the center is what I mean. When we do our classes, one thing that's really, really important is to try and practice mindfulness. Now, if you're part of our Facebook community where we all chat, you'll notice I bring this up a lot. Mindfulness is really important to help in managing stress 
feelings of overwhelm and anxiety and just helping you be present, feel a lot more balanced. The reason why I talk about this a lot with your classes is your classes are a mindfulness activity. Two types of activities you can do to relax. You've got mindless, things like just picking up your pencils and just coloring um, without instruction or anything like that. It's usually a mindless coloring, watching your TV, mindless activity. Um, just sort of vegging out is, is counted as mindless. And it's still important because you're just resting. These activities here, doing a lesson or say working out or other activities like that where you are a bit more actively engaged, these are called mindful activities. And this is where you activate different parts of your brain to be challenged and you actually occupy your mind. So when you occupy your mind, you're actually taking more of a break from stresses around you because you're actually stopping your mind from thinking and processing and going over and having that anxiety and worry that comes with everyday life. So this is what actually gives you a little bit of a mental break and relax and recharge. So this is why it's really important. I always see people say, oh, things are so busy right now. I don't have time to do my classes. This is why it's crucial to make time because it's about self-care. It's got nothing to do with the actual coloring, really. It's, it's just the activity, but it's actually to do with giving yourself an important mental break to recharge, to feel more balanced and less stress, and it helps you better deal with what's going on. It helps you better take care of others if you're in a situation where you're a caretaker or someone's quite sick. It helps you better perform at work as well. And it's just, it's so important to have a good balance between the mindless and the mindful activities so you can actually have a good quality and balance of life. So please, when you do feel overwhelmed and stressed in life, make time for these activities, make time for you, make you a priority. It helps so incredibly much. And yet we go into this, I think it's a sense of guilt that we can't possibly take a bit of a time out for ourselves when things are full on. So we go into a bit of an overdrive and we say we can't actually take a break because there's so much going on, we need to be focused. And it has the reverse effect because you end up frazzled, you end up overwhelmed. So you do need to step back when things happen in life. If you've got illness, family members got illness, work, stress, anything like that, then as soon as you feel that frustration or that anxiety build up, that is your body letting you know you need to take a break because you don't want to burn out. Please don't ever allow yourself to feel that way. And remember, if you're ever struggling and you're really struggling either to get started or with nerves or with anxiety or life is just hard, you aren't alone. I'm always one message away if you ever want someone to chat with. I know it's nice sometimes to chat with people who aren't related to all the stress going on as well. I'm always, always here if it's a really hard time and you do want someone to chat with. Or even if it's not a hard time, you just want to say hi. Or you are nervous to get started or to make a mistake. We can go through anything you need together because our classes, again, not about really coloring. They're about you. You're doing this for you. Not because coloring is so much fun and the best thing, even though it is a lot of fun. You've chosen to do this because you need to look after you. And that's really the 100% most crucial element of life and why you're here and why you're showing up today and why you're doing this. Okay, then once you're happy with that little circle of color, we can extend it out a little bit more with a slightly lighter color. So this is my powder blue, and I just, I'm sort of starting up about halfway, and I just come over that edge and then down into this remaining area. So I'm basically just going straight over where that other color ended, and I'm just fading it into the bottom. These colors are a similar tone, so they work really nicely just to fade out. And the color that I'm using here, this lighter blue, is really quite soft. So just make sure whatever color you use before 
you come in and use like a white it's just basically the softest color in that color family is really what we want to be using just something really soft and delicate You can see we're really getting that really nice, pretty fade happening there. Just going around a little bit on the top of the face. So you can see it's not a big halo of color all the way around. It's only just peeking out the extent of the actual image. This will help it to look a lot softer with the effect. Make sure this color ends really, really nice and soft. Now make sure along this edge that you have fairly good coverage and it's not fading out as very, very soft for too long. Otherwise, it's going to be harder to get that edge smooth. So you want to make sure that you do have fairly good coverage and it's just the very edge of the color that's doing that little fade. Otherwise, you can't really use your blender very effectively in there as well. And once you're happy with that, we grab our white pencil and just like when we did the grass, we start just off the color and then we just come back and over where that color has ended. And you should be able to blend that out pretty smooth to the paper. Okay, now once you've done that, I've got a little bit of tooth left. You can come through and repeat again in areas that you feel need it, or you can, of course, use that colorless blender. I'll leave that totally up to you. And that is our background all finished up. Now, I usually feel at the halfway point. This is when things can maybe start feeling a little strange, like they're not quite right. Maybe they're not quite how the class is meant to be. And I think the reason for that is it always looks weird with part of the image colored and part just white because you have so much stark contrast of color that it just doesn't feel quite right. So I just want to take the time to show you now. Don't forget we're going from this to this so don't worry if it feels weird at the moment or a little bit unnatural we've got a lot of detail to go and that depth is going to come in these final objects that we'll be adding in 
Remember when you're viewing your work, you want to make sure that you step back from it. Don't just view it in that up close mode because little things like maybe some of the angles of these are a little bit different. Those little things are not big in the scheme of it. When your piece is actually finished, your eye is going to be drawn to all the detail and they're not going to notice tiny little things that you maybe weren't 100% happy with at this early point. So that's why it's really important that we continue on and we finish up to see how these techniques come together. If you are really, really struggling though, remember now is the time to ask for help. Use the free private tutoring that's available. It's there to help you grow. So don't be afraid to send your photos through and we can work on some tips for you. Now, I'd love to see you be brave and share your work at this point, this halfway point. It's always a really, really good thing to actually share your work and to look at how you're talking about your work throughout the learning process. So this is some good art therapy tips for you right now. It's a really compulsive need to point out the things we don't like. It's a, it's like an inherent nature that we do this. We look for the worst. And unfortunately, the words that you use directly influence your confidence, your motivation, and your desire to keep going. So it's really important that we address how we actually talk about our work. And this includes when you're posting it. When you post online, you are not posting for anyone else. You're not posting for likes. You're not posting for comments. You are posting for you to acknowledge your growth. That's purely what it is. So it's really important when you're posting that you resist that urge to point out all the negatives. No one is judging your work. When you scroll through all the groups, are you sitting there pointing out every little mistake in everyone's work? Or when a friend shows you their work, do you go, well, that's nice, but you really messed up the sky there. No, you're focused on the positives. You're focused on the points that catch your eye the most. And that's what's important for you to do with your work. So when you share, which I want you to do, I want you to be brave and I want you to put it out there because it's you celebrating your growth. I want you to point out two things you feel that you've done well or you've learned in this lesson. No negatives. When it comes to critiquing your work, this should always be done privately. You can do this yourself or you can do this with me and we can work on those tips together. But instead of saying things like, I don't like the sky or I messed up the blending over here, what we want to do is we want to change our speech. So we want to say, next time I'm going to try this to get this result. Notice that all of a sudden you've taken out the negatives. There's no, I don't like, no hate, no mistake. There's no negative words that are used. You're actually purely focused on the lesson that you're taking away. This is where the growth is. So there's a difference between pointing out everything that's wrong and telling yourself it's not good enough or pointing out what you can do to grow. So it's really important that your mindset is focused on this because sometimes I have people say, well, me, when I tell myself everything I've done wrong, it helps me learn. It does, but it really doesn't at the same time. It's a demotivator. The way that we word that can actually help propel you forward always. And it helps to also break down those barriers of perfection. Because when people say, yeah, but telling myself what I've done wrong helps me learn, that can actually come from a perfectionism disorder. You're trying so hard to get it perfect that you're telling yourself what's wrong so you can continue to, to be perfect. So instead, I want you to break that down today. There isn't right and there isn't wrong. There is simply growth. So this is your lesson, your big, big lesson I want you to take away from this class and why I want you to share your work because I want you to start believing it is about growth and not about whether you're good enough or not good enough today because everything you're doing is that growth. It's that progression. It's helping you level up. So I want you to give yourself a big pat on the back right now because you've learned a whole lot of new techniques already and we've only just done chapter two. You've already leveled up. Even if you've done years of classes, you're focusing on refinement and that's really, really important. Once you learn technique, you then learn to refine and this may be where you're at now. You're always looking to level up, to challenge, to grow. So I'm looking forward to seeing your practice at this point. And remember, even if you are feeling really down about it, you've got to reach out privately. We've got to take those steps together and help you get back on that path of growth.
Welcome to the markers portion of the video tutorial. So we're working on getting that really pretty faded out background look. Now I'm using a few colors to do this. So basically I'm picking my main color. So I'm using B32. You can really use any color that you want to do this. Works better the lighter you are. Um, you can use darker colors though you just probably need a few more colors in the blend because we want to go from whatever your main color is to basically the lightest color in that color family. So even if this was like B97, so really dark blue, I'd probably still be using like B000. So something still like very, very light next to it. And then you just fill in those gaps with the other colors. So if this was B97, I'd use 95, 93, 91, probably B00 and then B000. So I'm taking it down through each color so I can essentially fade what that darkest main color is out to white. But between B32, B32 is fairly light. Um, between B32 and B000, I'm really only going to slot in B00. That should get me pretty close to fading out. One other color that's going to help me, it's not really a color, it's the colorless blender. That's going to help me fade everything out. So you can see main color, and then we've got the lightest color, and then the steps in between, plus blender. Now we're just going to be using the basic feathering step to do this technique. We went through that at the start of the markers video when we went over the different strokes. If you would like more information on what feathering is, make sure that you do check out that free markers 101 class because it does go through all of the strokes in a lot more detail. It is a very critical skill to have with your marker blending, probably more so than flicking because it's your basic foundation for smooth blends. So what we're really aiming to do is I'll just run through it really quickly again. We use the side of the marker and you can see I'm layering it up so I don't get flicks. You cannot really see anything individual there. I'm not getting this happening on the end. I'm using the side so I get that broad coverage. So that's all we're doing. So I'm going to grab B32 and I'm going to come nice and close to the deer. Now, what you can do to make it a bit easier, you can draw a thick line, doesn't need to be thin, right next to where you want to use this color and that'll act like a base. Now I'm not going to come around her like a halo, I'm just going to do little sections. And I'm going to keep the color close to the deer. I don't really want to come too far out. I want it to softly fade around her. So you can see I'm feathering with the side of the marker, little fat strokes there. Then the next color is B00. And all I'm doing is going straight over the top and now I start to get a little bit further out. So I'm blending further away from my character. Multiple strokes, I'm aiming to get the line of the colors nice and smooth. So I'm really focusing on layering my pigment where that line is more than anything. And then my next lightest color, B000, and that's coming even further out. And again, multiple strokes where this color has ended in particular. So if I go slow, I'm going over that area and then coming back and getting rid of everything. It's just we do them quick because it means that you're probably pressing less hard into the page, so using less ink, so a softer look. Now with this lighter color, you can start to come up and around that nose area because what I want is that faded look in a bit of a halo around. So at the top here, I probably wouldn't be using those darker colors just yet. Then we can grab our blender and basically all I do here is I just come over that edge and then just back if you need to and I'm just using it to soften out where that color has ended. It just takes a little edge off. Because the B000 is so light, it should just naturally help that to fade out. Now I'm going to bring the B32 inside the legs here. I want the darker color to be like that halo sort of effect around. 
It's just gonna get lighter underneath them a little bit. B double zero is next, and we just go straight over the top and extend further down. And then B triple zero. Now this other side, B32 close to the character. So remember we keep nice and close. We weren't actually extending the B32 that far on the other side. It doesn't matter if you get a little bit on your flowers too. You're not going to be able to see that by the time we add the beautiful bright pinks over them. But we start to curve. So imagine that curve around here. I'm also coming in nice and close to the G here because it's the same thing, it's that halo around this middle area. Now let's blend that out. So B double zero is next. Straight over the top and extending further. And then your B triple zero. And we're just doing that really nice faded halo around. And you want to make sure what you're doing on this side kind of matches with that other side as well. That way it all is going to look even. And you just create that halo around. It doesn't matter if it's not perfect. This is such a small detail. It is important to remember though that your image is only partly colored. So right now this is going to look like one of the most important things that you've done because it is one of the only things that you've done so if it stands out or you feel like it's not quite right just remember by the time you finish it's a background element that's going to fade away in the scene it's not even going to be noticeable you can now grab that blender come over the edge Just come over as needed. As it dries, it'll dry lighter. So you basically, the aim is just to get rid of the blue edging there. So it's just nice and soft. Now you can repeat everything as well if you want a little bit more depth. And I'll just show you what that's going to look like if I were to do it, say, in between the legs here. So if I grab B32 again, the color is going to hold a lot better the second time around. And you can extend the B32 further as well if you feel like it's quite light. It really just depends on the look you want and how far you went previously. B00 extending further down. Just make sure it sort of matches up. And can you see already how much extra depth doing that second layer adds? This is B000 now. So that's really going to give you more depth if you feel like it's lacking that little bit of depth at the moment. So I'll leave that up to you to go around if you want to repeat it or if you're happy, it's totally okay. But that is that beautiful faded edge. And again, as that dries, it's all going to come up nice and soft.
Now I usually feel at the halfway point. This is when things can maybe start feeling a little strange, like they're not quite right, maybe they're not quite how the class is meant to be. And I think the reason for that is it always looks weird with part of the image colored and part just white because you have so much stark contrast of color that it just doesn't feel quite right. So I just want to take the time to show you now. Don't forget we're going from this to this. So don't worry if it feels weird at the moment or a little bit unnatural. We've got a lot of detail to go and that depth is going to come in these final objects that we'll be adding in. Remember when you're viewing your work, you want to make sure that you step back from it. Don't just view it in that up close mode because little things like maybe some of the angles of these are a little bit different. Those little things are not big in the scheme of it. When your piece is actually finished, your eye is going to be drawn to all the detail and they're not going to notice tiny little things that you maybe weren't 100% happy with at this early point. So that's why it's really important that we continue on and we finish up to see how these techniques come together. If you are really, really struggling though, remember now is the time to ask for help. Use the free private tutoring that's available. It's there to help you grow. So don't be afraid to send your photos through and we can work on some tips for you. Now, I'd love to see you be brave and share your work at this point, this halfway point. It's always a really, really good thing to actually share your work and to look at how you're talking about your work throughout the learning process. So this is some good art therapy tips for you right now. It's a really compulsive need to point out the things we don't like. It's a, it's like an inherent nature that we do this. We look for the worst. And unfortunately, the words that you use directly influence your confidence, your motivation, and your desire to keep going. So it's really important that we address how we actually talk about our work. And this includes when you're posting it. When you post online, you are not posting for anyone else. You're not posting for likes. You're not posting for comments. You are posting for you to acknowledge your growth. That's purely what it is. So it's really important when you're posting that you resist that urge to point out all the negatives. No one is judging your work. When you scroll through all the groups, are you sitting there pointing out every little mistake in everyone's work? Or when a friend shows you their work, do you go, well, that's nice, but you really messed up the sky there. No, you're focused on the positives. You're focused on the points that catch your eye the most. And that's what's important for you to do with your work. So when you share, which I want you to do, I want you to be brave and I want you to put it out there because it's you celebrating your growth. I want you to point out two things you feel that you've done well or you've learned in this lesson. No negatives. When it comes to critiquing your work, this should always be done privately. You can do this yourself or you can do this with me and we can work on those tips together. But instead of saying things like, I don't like the sky or I messed up the blending over here. What we want to do is we want to change our speech. So we want to say, next time I'm going to try this to get this result. Notice that all of a sudden you've taken out the negatives. There's no, I don't like, no hate, no mistake. There's no negative words that are used. You're actually purely focused on the lesson that you're taking away. This is where the growth is. So there's a difference between pointing out everything that's wrong and telling yourself it's not good enough or pointing out what you can do to grow. So it's really important that your mindset is focused on this because sometimes I have people say, well, me, when I tell myself everything I've done wrong, it helps me learn. It does, but it really doesn't at the same time. It's a demotivator. The way that we word that can actually help propel you forward always. And it helps to also break down those barriers of perfection. Because when people say, yeah, but telling myself what I've done wrong helps me learn, that can actually come from a perfectionism disorder. You're trying so hard to get it perfect that you're telling yourself what's wrong so you can continue to, to be perfect. So instead, I want you to break that down today. There isn't right and there isn't wrong. There is simply growth. So this is your lesson, your big, big lesson I want you to take away from this class and why I want you to share your work because I want you to start believing it is about growth and not about whether you're good enough or not good enough today because everything you're doing is that growth. It's that progression. It's helping you level up. 
So I want you to give yourself a big pat on the back right now because you've learned a whole lot of new techniques already and we've only just done chapter two. You've already leveled up. Even if you've done years of classes, you're focusing on refinement and that's really, really important. Once you learn technique, you then learn to refine and this may be where you're at now. You're always looking to level up, to challenge, to grow. So I'm looking forward to seeing your practice at this point. And remember, even if you are feeling really down about it, you've got to reach out privately. We've got to take those steps together and help you get back on that path of growth. In this next chapter of the video tutorial, we're going to go ahead and color up our flowers. Now these are foxglove flowers and they come in such a huge variety of colors. There's so many different varieties that are available. I just wanted to use a color that would really pop and really stand out on the page here. And I have changed up the blend just a little bit. I'm not sure how well the camera is going to pick this up, but what I've actually got is a brighter fuchsia color at the bottom. So the fuchsia being quite uh, blue based with the color there. And then as we get up to the top, it gets a little bit warmer and I introduce more of the reds into the same blend. So I'm slowly changing the tone, warmer up the top and it gradually gets a little bit more cooler. So more red, more blue in that blend there. So there are ways that you can change up the color just by changing up the tone of the blend like we did with the grass. So when you have repeating elements, remember when we did all the different greens, so we had the leaves, we had these parts, we had the grass at the bottom. We talked about adding a little bit more interest just by changing up that tone of the blend. And that's what I'm doing through here. It gives something extra for your eye to really see. It's a little bit of extra detail without going to the whole lot of effort of doing say a two tone blend or doing something very intricate. And it's a really, really easy thing to do. All we're going to change up is one to two colors in the blend at the top. And then that really just changes that whole look and makes it a bit more dynamic. Now, when, when it comes to terms of light source, we're just going to be employing everything that we've already been talking about. So remember, anywhere that we want to appear raised up toward us, we're going to color that as lighter. So you'll notice through the main portion of these flowers here, it is that lighter color showing where it's raised up. Now, these flowers often have little creases in them over the surface every so often. So you'll notice every so often here, there's a slightly darker color indicating a little bit of like that um, sort of undulating surface. So every time we come in and use a darker color like this, we're indicating that that's a crease down. It's further down in the surface of the petal. Sides of the flower as well tend to be shadowed because they are curving around. It's a curved cylindrical object. So sides there are darker. Now this little part at the bottom, this flower is basically um, like an open tunnel. So you're seeing that's the bottom flap there. And then this little part here that you see is extending up inside the tube of the flower. So this part right here, that is like the, the outer lip of the petal. So you've got the outer lip the whole way around and then you go through that tunnel there. So we want the outer lip to appear like it's raised up because it does sit forward a lot more than the tunnel part at the back or even this little bit at the bottom here. So you'll notice on each of the flowers that is a little bit lighter so we can show that level change. And I'm using my cast shadow directly behind that lip so I can really definitely show that there is a difference there in those levels. So we're using color to help show the depth, to help show the distance between the objects there. And then as we extend into the tunnel, the side that's lower, you're seeing that little part there, that's the outer edge. And then as we go up and inside, that's where you get the darker color because that's your cast shadow from the lip being in front. So think of it like curving back in on itself like this here. And you can even see from my hand, this part of my hand being in front is casting a shadow straight underneath, which is exactly what we're getting through here. Where it does join on, these smaller petals are joining into the greenery here. You'll notice a little bit of a cast shadow as well. The greenery comes out and it sits over the top. So we do get a little bit of that cast shadow underneath there where it's joining in. 
So that's really it. Now we're just gonna go ahead and start applying that detail. So I'll break it down with pencils first and then markers. Welcome to the pencils portion of the video tutorial. Now make sure that you've watched the start of this chapter where we run through some of the basics here, but otherwise let's get ready to jump in. I'm gonna move that off to the side. I'm going to start with process red. Now it's not the darkest color in my blend. It is more toward the mid-tone. That way I'm gonna map in where I want everything to go, make sure I'm happy with it before I come back with my darkest color for the very cast shadows. Now. The reason for this is I don't want to use too much of the darkest color. I would usually be using the darkest color first, but I just want this blend to be really bright, really vibrant in your face. I don't want it to get too deep and dark and on that burgundy sort of side. So I'm just relying on myself not to uh, be able to scale it back. So doing it all with this color first means I can get pretty heavy handed. It's going to be easy to see. And then I can come back and just add a little less of that darker color. Okay, so let's get ready to jump in. I'm gonna grab this process red and I'm just gonna come and do some of my cast shadows. So I'm coming straight underneath that top lip that we talked about before. And you can see I'm curving along, I'm using the shape of the flower as a guide. And you can see I am adding thickness as well. I don't want it to be super thin lines. Cast shadow behind that top lip as well. So you really want that to be a lot lighter, showing that it is raised up. You can come in and do some of your form shadows around here too. Use the outline of the flower to help you indicate where the detail is going to be. Cast shadow along the top here. So even at this top part here, what I can do where we've come in from that little stem, we can extend a little bit of a detail line down. We're creating a little bit of depth in the sides here as well, that form shadow. So my shadows are not just thin lines. You can see they have texture, they have depth there because I'm trying to show that it is a three-dimensional object. It's curving around. It's not just a really thin little line. So don't be afraid to really get in there and thicken everything up when you're working with your shadows. Don't forget any cast shadows from flowers that are in front. They're always going to cast a shadow back. Behind the deer is also well. the deer is sitting in front of these flowers. So there's going to be a shadow happening back there as well. Do some of those detail lines down. So once you really know the formula, you can see we're just repeating it the whole way around. So that's the thing with light source. Yes, it's tricky. You're learning a lot of information. Once you've done it a couple of times, it all sinks in and you're able to just focus on the technique that you're doing instead. And don't forget every little flower you color, every time you pick up your pencils, it's a chance to maybe correct something that you're not 100% happy with. So if you're quite heavy handed, you can say, okay, on the next one, I'm going to focus on pulling back the amount of pressure I use. I'm just going to try and focus on being really light. 
Don't just rush through and color everything exactly the same way. Use every practice as your chance to improve, your chance to understand a little bit more. Ask yourself, why am I placing the shading here? Where are the cast shadows? Don't just copy what's happening in the video. Think about these theories that we're going through. It also depends how long you've been coloring as well. If you're brand new, don't waste too much time trying to worry about getting it all perfect and understanding it all today. You'll get it the more classes you do, the more you practice it. But if you have been coloring for a little while and maybe you find it harder to translate some of the um, techniques into your images after class, then it's time for you to actually start looking at that theory, paying a little bit more attention to things like light source when it's tricky. And as you color, just say, think to yourself, okay, where are my cast shadows? What's sitting in front? Remind yourself of these steps that we go through and the more you do them, the easier that is going to get. Okay, now can you see in some of these flowers where we've got places where there's quite a few overlapping elements, we don't have a huge amount of depth because the process red sort of all blends into each other. So we can actually come back and add in those very darkest shadows with Tuscan red. So this is what I was talking about before. It's easy to add in all of the color just now with the process red because I was able to do my car shadows and my form shadows. But the very, very car shadow areas that are further back, they need a little bit extra. So even just here, if I grab Tuscan Red and I'm just applying it on that flower that's just so obviously behind the rest, and now does that level look clearer? You can definitely see that that's further back. So I'm not going to apply this color everywhere, but I'm going to focus on the parts where those car shadows get a little lost. So really making sure I look at which flowers are further back or where I really want to show that depth. And I do want to apply this just inside that top lip as well, just so I can really show that difference in height. I 
Now you can blend out some of what you've just did with that process red again. So just come straight over the top. Make sure the process red extends further than the Tuscan red that you've used. You don't want just lines. Make sure you've got actual depth in your shading happening. And don't be afraid to get pretty thick with this color as well. I want that blend to be really bright and really pop out. So if I don't use enough, the blend will end up being a lot softer. So if you've been a little bit light on using it, really come back in now and build up a little bit more. All right, next color, hot pink. And I'm just going to come straight over the top and extending a little further out. So you can see there I'm coming over, bringing in toward the highlight. Now, because I want this blend to be quite vibrant, I'm making sure that I actually extend the color fairly far. Otherwise, the blend's going to end up a little bit too pastel and soft. Now still using this color, I want to add in a little bit of detail in these top lips because I want to show that that has an undulation as well. So anywhere in this top lip where it's pointing down, pointing down is further from the light because when we have our, our light rays coming down, anything that's up, think of it like a mountain, it's raised up. So the light's hitting that first. And when it's pulling down like this, it's last because it's like a little valley. So I just pop in a little bit of the hot pink in those little valley areas where I want it to appear like it's a little lower. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's such a small detail with a lighter color. So it's not going to be super prominent. It's just to help us create those levels through there. All right, next color, deco pink. And continue blending out. You don't need to apply over the whole area though. Leave a little bit of white in the very highlights and we can come in with our white pencil to really make them pop out. It's not a lot of white though. It's like you're leaving little slithers just in the very, very highlight area. And I'm blending out these inner parts toward that bottom lip. Continuing to blend out the shading you added in the top lip, like those little undulations, but I'm not covering the whole area. I'm leaving quite a bit of white in that top lip so I can really show that it is higher.
you know, grabbing that wide pencil and we're just coming from the highlights, blending back and over where the pink has ended. So you don't want to come over everything because that will lose the depth. So it's just in those highlight areas and that includes your top lip. All right, round one of the blend is done. We've got a bit of tooth showing. We don't have a whole lot of detail yet. So you know what that means. We're going to repeat everything, build it up a little bit more. So Tuscan Red here, and I'm just literally applying it where I did step one. Now, if you were pretty light-handed with your colors the first time around, don't forget you can always come back and add them in again and really build everything up. You can always thicken lines up and add extra whenever you do your second coat if you feel it needs it. Next color, process red, straight over the top and extending a little further out. So we're just repeating. Don't forget this color is kind of your main color. This is your big mid-tone color. Apply quite a bit of it so the blend is not too light. We wanted that really bright, pretty fuchsia sort of color way here.
All right, hot pink is next and we're just continuing to do that blend out. Don't forget to also add this into any of the undulations in the uh, top lip as well. Color coming quite far over the main tunnel like part of the flower. So it is a brighter blend. Again, you don't need to bring it through the entire area. You can leave that little slither of white so you do get that pop through the highlight. We can brighten it up. And you can do that now. Grab your white and focus this in the very highlights in the top lip, so any areas that you want to appear raised up and lighter. Okay, now grabbing Carmine Red, this is when we're going to do that little bit of a two-tone blend. So I'm just coming into the ones at the top, and I'm just going to add this over my shadow and flick toward the highlight. So this is just slightly changing the tone on the little petals that are at the top. And I'm not sure how well the camera picks this up, but it really just warms the blend. Definitely seeing that change in the color. Now, if you've got any hard lines, you just grab your white and really softly just run it over where the carmine red has ended just to remove any lines between. And then the same on the other side. So you can see how easy it is just to add in this extra color to shift that tone. So we're not doing a whole lot of fancy stuff. I'm literally just applying over the shading that I've already laid down and just using that as my base foundation and just slightly changing the tone at the top. And then you should have that gradual fade of the color. Using Tuscan Red, I'm just going to do the little dots in these center parts. So you can do as many or few as you like. Just try and leave a gap between them and that'll make them stand out. But these flowers usually have like little dots in that center part there. Whenever you color florals, it's always a great idea to just pop on Google and see the different types of varieties they come in, the colors, the patterns, the markings. It's those things which help your coloring look more realistic. Don't just rely on the artist to have drawn them in because a lot of the time they don't add in those individualized markings. So I find that's often a big difference in seeing the level of someone's coloring ability as well. Or like seeing like how well coloring pieces come up. It's just whether they've gone to that extra effort of looking at how that flower or that object, whatever it is, actually looks like in real life. Thank you. 
And then I'm also going to add a little bit of canary yellow just on those insides as well. So again, just grabbing this lighter color and you can see I'm just really quickly rubbing it through those inside areas, but it's changing up the tone of that blend, the color hue there. Adding in that little bit of extra interest, but I'm not really doing anything. I'm just going over the shading that's already been done. And that's the flowers all done. So if I zoom out, you can see it's coming together. Most of our piece here is done. We've used all those same beautiful color theories and everything in the flowers here. We've looked at light source. We've created all that depth. So all we have left to do now is our little deer. Right, let's get started on the markers portion of the video. Now I'm not going to start with my darkest color here. Usually I would, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to map in all of my shading with RV09 first. Now the reason for this is I don't want my blend to get too dark. If I use my darkest color first, there's a chance I'm going to be pretty heavy handed and thick with that darkest color. And I really only want to reserve it for my absolute cast shadows, using it more for levels than for the actual color itself. So let's jump in with the RV09. We're going to add in all of our shadows. So cast shadows around any flowers that are in front. Now, some of these are small details. If you struggle with fine lines, remember, hold that marker close to the nib. Hold the marker upright. And you can dab the marker just lightly touching the nib to the surface rather than drawing and pushing the marker down into the surface of the paper. Cast shadow around the deer here. And then you can come along that inside lip as well. It doesn't need to be super fine, like a little bit of thickness is actually really going to help you show these levels a little clearer as well. Up the side, now underneath that little stem, and you can use that little detail to show that little crease in the petal there as well. And I'm just adding to all of my shadow areas around here, just like we talked about at the start. And remember, if you go out of the lines, the benefit of using the snow lines version is no one's going to be able to tell. So you can even create your own outer edges now. So just do whatever you're comfortable with. And remember, the only way to get better at fine lines is simply just to practice them. I know it's tricky, it is for absolutely all of us. I just used to practice pages and pages of just doing my fine line detailing, control of the marker, but it doesn't just get easier in, in say a couple of practices. It's just something that you constantly work at. I find as well when I have a bit of a break with my coloring, when I come back, my fine lines aren't as good. And, um, it's just the same with everything, you know, like if you're not giving it that constant practice, then it's just one of those things you have to accept that, okay, I need to give it that time. I need to give it that effort to get back in the swing of things. It's like playing a musical instrument. The more you do, the more depth you get at it. All right, let's blend out with the other colors. So I'm going to come in with a little bit of RVO4 now. Straight over the top and extending a little further out. And 
Now again, some of these details are small. Just dabbing the marker rather than drawing is perfect. Just make sure that you do multiple dabs over the one area so we can soften that line of the previous color. This sort of a detail looks really messy as you're doing it. It's only when the blend is complete that it makes a lot more visual sense. So don't worry if you feel maybe a little lost when you do little details like this. That's normal. You're just following the shapes and you need to really see it through to actually see that finished result there on the paper. I think a lot of learning is just accepting that you know, halfway through, it's just going to look a little funny <laughs> and you just have to keep going and really see how that result ends up because when you actually do finish it and the colors come together and the techniques come together, it just makes sense. Whereas halfway you're like, mm, not a hundred percent sure. RVO2 is next. So you can see the more I do, the more white space I cover, the more the shapes start to look a little bit better on the paper. I'm starting to actually get that floral shape happening. Now with this color as well, we wanna use this into that top lip of the flower. So we wanna imagine that top lip sort of like an undulating surface, so it's sort of curving over the top. So rather than just doing nothing, which will indicate that it's flat, what we can actually do, wherever we have those dips down, we can add some color. So dipping down means it's like a valley, it's further from the light. Dipping up like this, well not dipping up, but popping up, the light hits that first, so that's lighter. So in all the little dips, you can go ahead and add just a dab of this color and you'll start to get that movement happening around as well. And then RV double zero and you can blend out now. Now you don't need to cover the entire area. When you get to your very, very highlights, if you leave just some little slithers of white, it's going to really help everything pop out. So it's not leaving big areas of white, it's just leaving, like the color just fades into the white in some parts where it's just really nice and vibrant. Now we can come in and deepen up some of those areas like we talked about with the darker color. So it's areas that are quite obviously further back. So things like this, where that petal is underneath these two, adding in RV69, that little bit of dimension, see how you can really create those levels there now. Now this step is of course optional. It is, look, if you're, if you're working with light source and you wanna create the depth we're doing in class, You've got to start practicing it. You've got to be brave. You've got to add in those darker colors. However, if you're really uncomfortable with fine lines right now, you can just leave it out and it's something you can come back to. Remember though, class time is practice time. I'd rather you have a go in class and just really make a mistake and be like, that just didn't work and send the photo to me and we can talk about why it didn't work, what tips we can try next time and that sort of thing. Because that's really your opportunity to have the lesson. So I'd rather you do it and stuff it up royally than be the person who was too scared to do it. 
but you know I'm gonna leave that up to you here today you've already done quite a lot of the image so if you're just not a hundred percent sure like you are ready for that you can come back and try it but maybe even what you could do is start printing two images when you do a class and this could be like you could have a practice sort of throwaway image where you just do a little bit of that experimenting on and that way if you treat it like a bit of a throwaway image you're less likely to worry if something really goes wrong it's less upsetting so it can be a little bit more motivating for your confidence now with this color as well what I'm going to do is just a few dabs in this bottom area to create the pattern that is reminiscent of the flux glove so they're quite large and sort of messy circular shapes it's always a great idea to look up on google your florals because a lot of them have very unique markings similar to the flower and so just seeing how these are represented in nature can help you make your coloring look a lot more realistic and just aim the biggest aim when you do little details like this is just to space them out so you can see the texture You can come back with your other colors as well and continue to blend. So RV09 straight over the RV69, give you a little bit more depth and help to blend everything smooth. Just like we did in previous steps, like when we did all the leaves, the second round of the blend really makes the colors jump off the page. Again, it's absolutely optional. If you haven't added the RV69 and you're quite happy with where it is right now, you can absolutely just leave it there. And I'm just going to blend a little bit just into that tunnel area as well, a bit of that car shadow. RV04. Now I'm using quite a lot of this color because I do want the blend to be quite light and bright. If you were a little light-handed the first time, when you do the second round of the blend, you always have the opportunity to increase the colors so you can control how vibrant everything turns out. RVO2 is next and you're continuing to blend. And then RV00. Now I grab my Y11 and I'm just going to dab this into the bottom of these areas here and you can see it's such a quick and easy way to create that two-tone finish. So I'm just grabbing the really light yellow color and you just dab it through the highlight in some of those areas and it would just add that extra interest. And I did talk before as well about the little bit of two-tone in the top. You can grab RV25 and I'm just flicking this through my shadow areas and 
I'm not sure how well the camera is going to pick this up, but it just adds that warm tone straight over the top of those lighter pinks. So you're just really subtly changing the tone of the blend for more interest. And you can even grab your RV23 and then just soften out any edges on the RV25. But basically it uses all that foundation and base you did with the other colors and you're just coming over the top and just slightly changing the shadow to mid-tone. So you should have it more warm at the top and a brighter pop at the bottom. Again, this probably isn't going to pick up great on the camera because it's just a slight shift, but it's that slight shift in real life that really adds that little bit of extra level of detail, that extra oomph to your work. And that, if I zoom out, is actually my flowers all finished up. So we're almost there now. We just have our little deer left to do. But we've employed all those same theories we've been going over and over on the flowers. We've got the color, the light source, adding in the depth, adding in the textures. And you can see we visit that every time we color up an object to continue to add that detail in our work. Welcome to the last chapter of the video tutorial and now we're going to be going ahead and coloring up our deer. So we've got quite a few things that we're going to cover in this tutorial. So we're going to be looking at all the contouring light source and the creating that depth that we've been doing in the rest of the chapters on our deer here. And we're also going to be introducing the concept of coloring fur. Now fur is one of those things that comes up in a lot of different images, a lot of different styles as well. Now the techniques you learn today can be applied to any style of image, no matter if it's a cute stamp or a more realistic image, you can just scale it to suit. Now when you are coloring fur, there's a few things you want to keep in mind. One, in, and the most important I think, is how close you are to the actual character in the scene. Now if you have a really big character and say you've just got its face and there's not really many background elements, then you're going to be very, very close up to that animal. And that's when you draw in all those individual strokes and you draw in all the shadows to show where the fur is clumping and everything like that as well. In this case, we're not as close. And we can tell that by the fact that we've got all the background here, we've got quite a bit of depth happening. We've got all of this happening at the top as well. There's, and we're seeing that whole deer in the scene. So we've got quite a bit of distance between us and this animal. So what we want to do is we want to indicate that the animal is textured, but we don't need to draw in every single individual stroke. You don't need to be seeing every single piece of fur possible. Imagine when you're looking at images online, if you were to Google deer, a close-up image where it's it's very close, um, you may be seeing just the face, you would see all that texture. When you're seeing the full body like this and a bit of that background scene, you are only seeing indications of the texture. And it's the parts where the light are hitting that you get this nice, really light color coming through. And when you have the shadow, you get a little bit more of that texture there because we actually... Can, the way we see the fur is we see the shadows through the fur. So that's what we really want to be thinking about. So I'm scaling the amount of texture that I create based on how close I am to the character. But like I said, this technique that you're using today can be applied to absolutely any image at all. So you can take what you're learning here and practice it on other images, which will help the technique get easier as well. Now in terms of contouring, it's all about that light source that we've been talking about. We've already been going through it in every chapter that we've gone through already. The parts that are raised up, popping up toward us, are going to be the lightest and brightest because that's where your light's hitting first. So notice areas like the back here. That part's such a strong muscle and it usually pops out toward us. So that's nice and light coming through the middle of the body where it's rounding out toward us and even through the middle of the legs. So start to think in terms of three-dimensionality now. Now, I want you never to think in terms of just a flat image again. Think about what's happening if this was real life. So the leg here, the shape of that is cylindrical. So it's not just flat. We're thinking in terms of that three-dimension 
it's popping up towards us in the middle and the sides curving around as we create that cylindrical shape. So the part that's popping out toward us is straight through the middle there. So when our light comes down, it hits that part that's popping out toward us first. And that's why the middle of the leg is lightest and you have shading to both sides. So if you've got legs on any of your characters, don't just add shading to one side. It's lightest through the middle, darkest on both sides as it rounds around. So we're always now starting to think about that form, thinking about where the light's hitting, thinking about the parts that are curving around and away from the light. That's what's going to give you the most dimension. And that's really how we've approached this here today. And you can see any muscle definition, we're coming around that, we're showing where it's slanting down, like in the knee area here, this part raised up, this part slanting down toward the knee, so in a bit of shadow. Cast shadow around the legs that are in front. So these two here popping out in front of the body. So because they're raised up, we get a cast shadow because we suddenly have overlapping elements. So cast shadow behind those legs that are in front. A little bit of a dip in the back here. So where it's dipping down, we add a little bit of shadow showing that that's dipping away from the light. Nice shadow underneath the head. The head sits over the neck, so it's always going to have a strong shadow through there and also behind that leg as well. Now in the face, what usually happens is we've got some different level changes here. So you can see I've got quite a bit of the darker color on top and especially through the dips. So where the nose is dipping here and where it's curving back. Lighter through that top part that's popping up. So again, using the parts that are raised up as showing us lighter. Nice big raised cheeks, going to be a lot lighter there as well. In the ears, we're adding a little bit of pink to create some soft creases and that different uh, texture through here. And same around the eye. I like to keep around the eye and the nose or mouth areas on my animal images a little bit lighter than the main color. So this usually helps to draw attention to these areas as well. And you'll find on most animals, they do have the markings like this too. It can be quite lighter around those feature areas to help draw that attention to them. We'll get lighter on the legs and lighter on the belly. Now we use the same blend to do this, but we just leave out the darker colors. So what this is called is adjusting the value of the color. Now value is how light or dark a color blend is. So you may have one color blend and if I increase the amount of the darker colors used and really make them really thick and I don't really use a lot of the lighter colors and I may even leave out some lighter colors, then this is going to make the value quite deep and dark. Then if I take that same blend and I cut off some of the darker colors and I really increase the amount of the lighter colors used, it's going to be the same color family, so the same hue and tone, but it's just going to be a lighter blend. So nothing's really changed here, but just the amount of the colors that I've used in each to create the two differences. That's a really important thing because when you come to coloring your own images, oftentimes you'll want to adjust the value of the blend to show areas that are lighter and areas that are darker. And if you color monochromatic or sepia images, it's the same thing. So you pick your one color blend and when you want it lighter, you increase the amount of the light colors used. When you want it darker, you increase the amount of the darker colors used. Okay, so that's really it. Let's just go in and get started and get coloring up with this little deer. I'm going to be using my pencils first and then we'll come back and use our markers. Okay, let's get ready to jump in with our pencils. Make sure you've watched the start of the video where we go through all of our color theories. Now I'm going to start by doing up some of the facial details because I feel like when you don't have that done, it can look a little bit funny and it draws your attention away a little bit, like it just doesn't feel quite right. So if we add them in first, it's going to help ground the image and gives us a really good base to start with. So I'm going to use a sharp black pencil and I'm just going to come around the nose. I want to leave a little bit of white toward the upper part of the nose, which is going to show high shine. Coming down and into the mouth. 
And now we're going to come and do the eye as well. And I'm just tracing around the eye. You can see there's a few little dots in that the artist has left. And that's going to help to show a highlight. So that little shine within the eye. So many different ways to do eyes. The more highlights you leave, the more whimsical a look it really gets. But all of that is stylistic choice. There's not a right or wrong way to do that sort of a thing. And you can even do a few little eyelashes as well. This sort of thing. Again, personal choice, whatever you prefer. If you find that you lose a little bit of highlight in the eye, you can always go and grab a white gel pen. So I like to use a Uniball Signo and you can just add it back in. So super easy to do. And if you add too much of that, you can always dab your black pencil back. So you can basically, basically go back and forth until you're happy with the final outcome that you have. I'm just going to come down now and do the hooves here. So going to add the black the whole way around and I'm going, I want to show a little bit of high shine. So I'm adding quite a bit of black from the back area toward where it would be popping out toward us. And then I'll just stop that there. All right, and then I'm just going to soften that out just a little bit by using my 50% warm gray. And I'm just feathering toward that remaining highlight there. Now make sure the strokes all line up and you should be left with a little pop of white, which helps to show our shine. So shiny objects are created by high contrast between deep rich shadows and bright white highlights. So that's all we're showing there. Okay, coming into the ears, let's do that little bit of pink detail there. I'm going to use a little bit of nectar. I'm just going to come between those two little folds that have been drawn in. You can even create a little bit of detail along those side, is, side edges as well. And then I'm going to blend that out with deco peach. So it's just really pretty and soft. So basically creating those soft folds in the ear material. And you can blend that out with a little bit of white. So it just fades into the white of the page. Okay, now once you're done with that, let's jump into the main part of the deer. So we're going to add in some of our shadows first. So this is my dark brown pencil and what I'm going to do is we're just going to add some shading to the deer without worrying about any texture. So we're going to just color it just like normal, just like we've been doing throughout the video already. So thinking about light and shade, adding this color to the parts that are further from the light. Coming in around the ears here. Inside edge of the ear. Underneath the neck area. Just a little bit on this side as well. I want this side to be a bit lighter, so I'm not adding too much on that side. We can do a little bit of muscle contouring in the neck. Usually the deer has quite a strong muscle that will run through 
from the back here toward the front. So you can come down and just angle it toward that line at the bottom. So just keep it soft. That's the start of that muscle. And a little bit in the back. Coming along the back where you do have that dip. into the tail area here as well. So again, another little dip as we get toward the tail. So we are adding in our shading through there. A little bit of shading around. Now I want the back of his little butt to be white. So I'm gonna add a little bit of shading just offset from that. And you can see I've done that by using a really soft layered stroke, a little bit of contouring around the leg. Now with this here, I want the belly to be nice and light. So I'm coming around the leg, but then to do my shading, I'm going to come up a little bit. So not just adding it around the bottom, leaving a little bit of a gap for that lighter belly and then coming into that upper area. And you can do the same on this side as well. And then just tracing that around to start creating that contouring. And bring it into the front leg too. And then sort of continue that around a little bit there. So you're creating that muscle definition. You can even start to extend up toward that muscle shading that you did earlier there as well. Into the legs, we've got a little bit of a dip in here where we've got that uh, muscle definition. So I'm going to use that other side here as well. And then this is where the color is going to taper off at that knee section. So we'll just leave it at that point. A little bit of shading in the leg that's further back here too. Coming into the back legs here, I've got the definition where my knee is going to be. Okay, so that's where we're going to leave that darkest shading. So now we can start to blend that out and add the rest of the colors in. So I'm going to bring in Sienna Brown now. And that's going to come straight over what I've just done and start to extend a little further out. So we're using the contouring that we've already done and just continuing to blend. So the best thing about this is once you've added in all of your contouring with your darkest color, you know the steps, you know it's just that basic blend out now. So it should be a lot easier with each color that you use. Harder steps always the first when you have to do all of that contouring and everything yourself. Now, how much of each color you use is going to influence how dark the deer ends up. So that's going to end up being totally up to you. They come in all different colors as well. So there is not really a right or wrong way to do this. So it's really, really important to remember that if yours ends up a little bit darker, a little bit different, that doesn't mean that anything is wrong. It just means that it's different. So the more of each color that you use, the darker the blend is going to be. And the less of the darker colors and more of the lighter colors that you use, the lighter the blend is going to be. Now you can see as I blend out and I get toward those spots, I'm just coming around them for the moment. We're not working on texture just yet. We're going to do that in a later step.
Next color in the blend is burnt ochre. This is one of the main colors I'm going to be using, so I am extending it a little bit further out. Again, it's still just a basic blend. I'm just going to really lightly, just really, really lightly come from that top. So I've just come around the mouth area and I'm just starting the shading back here. Just a little bit of contouring. A little bit of shading into the belly, so the sides are curving away from the light, so we still want to show a little bit of shading. Again, coming in and around the spots, and just keep your pressure light. We're not aiming to blend out any tooth of the paper here. We're just getting each color down. We're just starting our blends off. So you can see coming around the leg now, building up that shading at the knee. And then you can even start to bring this down into the rest of the leg. So adding to the sides because the sides are curving away from the light. And don't feel like your shading has to be super neat here because the deers are not brushing themselves. They have a little bit of natural texture and roughness to them. That's always going to look more natural than if we were to come through and make everything super nice and neat. A little bit of that rugged texture enhances that woodland look and again that's going to be specific to what animal you're using a lot of these things are stylistic choices so the amount of texture you use comes down to what you want to portray how close you are to the animal and all those little extra things to start thinking about but typically i find i find people can be a little bit too clean with their fur. Fur is not about fine lines or being super uh, precise like hair would be. Fur is about being a little rougher, a little messier. So it's not as scary or hard as hair is at all. It's just about getting those textures and that contouring down the page more than anything. So don't ever be nervous anytime there's a class on fur because it's actually one of the easier techniques to learn and a great way to learn your fine lines without needing everything to be really on point, really precise. So you can see the contouring is starting to come together now, it's starting to get there. Still got a lot of colors to go, so let's keep continuing. So I've got Goldenrod next. Now I'm going to come in and around the eye. Now I want to leave a nice outline around the eye here. We're starting to create that pretty pattern in the face. Coming into the neck, 
So literally just coming back over the previous and extending further out. Come in and around those spots for now. We still have another color to use in the highlights, so make sure you don't bring this color through everything. also blend a little bit into the leg area here as well but you'll see I'm leaving quite a lot of the highlight in the leg areas because I do want them to finish up as a lighter value than the rest of the body. Next color is going to be beige. Now this is the lightest color in the blender apart from the white. So with this one now, we are going to extend a lot further over the areas. Now in the legs, come back over what you've done previously and extend out toward the highlight, but don't bring this color over the whole highlight area. Leave a little bit of that white paper and we can brighten that blend up even more. And you can see I'm not taking my time to blend everything smooth. So in our other chapters, notice how I really took my time. I did nice little small circles because we wanted to flatten that tooth. I am not doing that at all here. I'm coming in really rough, long strokes. Long strokes will equal texture at the end with pencils because what we're doing is we end up skipping parts of the tooth. So we're not actually covering everything. And by doing this, it means that some areas remain raised, some areas get flattened. So you're just allowing yourself to create a natural texture. All right, now I'm just going to bring my white pencil and I'll just bring you through my very highlights, especially in some of those raised up areas. So it's not going to be everywhere. It's just the areas that are definitely a lot lighter. So especially through the middle of those legs. Now I'm just going to flatten a little bit of the tooth using my blender pencil. So I'm just starting in my shadow area. I'm just really quickly running this from the shadow through to the highlight. Again, it's nice long strokes. I'm not focusing on being perfect. I'm coming roughly around these spots, but I'm not really trying to make it very neat. I'm just flattening a little bit of the tooth down in my paper. Thank you. 
If you don't have a blender pencil, you can roughly repeat the steps again. But don't focus on flattening all of the tooth in the paper. Don't focus on smooth. It's just coming through quickly so I can just, I'm taking out a little bit of the tooth to make adding the texture a bit easier. When you work with texture lines, it's always easier to do this over smoother paper because imagine the, the textured paper is really good for layering color because it's about layering and holding the blends and making everything smooth and making everything rich and vibrant. But when we do say sketching, for example, we want to smooth the paper because we suddenly want all these crisp lines. So it's the same for fur or hair. All of a sudden, instead of doing a nice blend of color, we want to actually see individual lines. So if we can get the paper fairly smooth, it's just going to hold that detail a little bit better. So essentially, that's what I'm doing. I'm now, I've added my blend, and now I'm flattening the paper so that I can then go back and add my texture. So I'm changing the structure of the paper to hold the textured lines. Okay, so let's quickly assess. You should have your deer roughly smooth. Um, maybe the colors are not as rich as you'd like at the moment. But if we really essentially look at it, all the contouring and the shading and everything's there. It's all there, but it's just rough. We don't have that soft texture over the top and we maybe don't have as much depth as we'd like. So now what we do is we're going to come back and add the texture over the top. So the benefit here is that I've got all the contouring done, got all the lights off done. I just want to add my strokes, my darkest color strokes, over where I did the darker color base and keep going with each color blending through to the highlight. So again, once you've done this, the hardest thing is done. We're just adding a texture over the top. Now, I did talk before about when we're creating fur, um, when we're a little bit further away like we are now, how we just see a hint of texture rather than individual strokes. So this technique is for a hint of texture. If you wanted to do, um, you may see some people will draw in individual strokes and it will be super, super neat. That's a little bit of a different technique. So we wouldn't really do this blending first because we've flattened so much of the tooth, it's a bit harder to be able to see all of those individual strokes. So this is a slightly different technique from that, but this is still gonna work for all of your character stamps. So what I want you to do now is go back, sharpen up all of the pencils. We'll just use the same color blend. Okay, so I've got dark brown. Now literally what the technique is, is I'm going to be doing stroke, leave a gap, stroke. And that's it, I'm just doing strokes. And you can see I slightly lift at the end of each one so they get softer on the end. But that's all it is. The key to getting the texture is leaving the gaps between the strokes, not how fine the stroke actually is. So it's when we see in between the strokes, the lighter color in between them is what makes the darker color stand out. So you can see I'm just starting in my shadow area and I'm just doing each individual little stroke. You can go over any shadows as well. So in the ear, we don't have a lot of textured strokes, but we do have quite a bit of shadow. So you can always go over some of that texture again if you want it to be a little bit more prominent as well. But otherwise, it's literally just following these shapes and details that you did in the earlier part of the video. Just remember, the more you use of the darker color, the darker the blend is going to become. So you're not really using a lot of dark brown. That's just to show the absolute deepest shadows.
And this is also why it's so important to be using good cardstock. So if you're using just say, um, like printer paper right now, or even you might be using like marker paper if you're new to using pencils and you're just sort of starting out with them. These smooth papers are not going to allow you to really build up the pigment like we're doing in class here today. So you may find that the paper sort of starts resisting a little bit and you're not really able to build up and see a lot of the depth of color or a lot of the texture. That's not anything that you're doing wrong. Next color, sienna brown, we just repeat. But what's actually happening is that you need to have the paper with the tooth to allow you to really build everything up. That's what allows you to come back over the top and then continue to really add in these textures and layers. So this is why it, it takes practice to use. I'm, I'm not going to tell you it's super easy because I know a lot of people struggle when they first start with this paper and they go, how do I get it all flat? And I think the biggest concern is you can see those white speckles. All those white speckles mean is that you can continue to layer up like we are now, like we do with our basic blends. So if you ever have white speckles showing, that's actually a great thing. It means that you have the ability to keep working the paper. So don't get frustrated. Learn about that control. Repeat. Make your strokes a little smaller. Work the blend a little more. As I get to these little spots here, what I'm doing is just adding my strokes in and then I overlap with the edge of the spot a little bit. So basically we should have these textured strokes just fading into the spots of the deer. But if your paper is smooth, it's just going to resist that buildup. So I get questions a lot from people saying it just doesn't look as rich or it doesn't look as smooth as yours. It's usually the paper. It's not usually their technique. Don't forget we've got a whole list of papers on our website under the coloring FAQs tab as well. If you would like to try something else, you don't need to use what I'm using at all. There's a lot of different papers available. And another thing is try not to wait until you feel you're good enough to use certain papers. I think I kind of, not sure how to say, but it, um, I really get a little frustrated sometimes when people say this because as soon as we think we're not good enough, it's never going to be good enough. At what level do you decide, okay, now I'm good enough to be able to use the cardstock that's going to help me because the problem is is that using good products helps you get good results so if you're there using printer paper not because you can't afford it but because you don't want to waste the good stuff for your practices how are your practices ever going to get there when you're not using the products that are going to help you get a result you're going to be happier with i guess is what i'm trying to say so don't feel like you have to wait because you could get a result you're going to like more simply by learning how to do it on the things that best facilitate your medium early on. Burnt ochre is next. We just continue to doing the blend straight over the top and add those strokes, leaving a gap as you get to your spots. Extend into them, but not over them. You're just coming over that very edge. Because whenever you have pattern like this, the pattern is still fur, it's still textured, just like the rest of the fur. So we want to show where it morphs from the brown to the white, that it does have that texture.
goldenrod is next now this color because it's the lightest color apart from the beige we're going to do this through the highlight area but make sure when you do it that you do space it out because you're basically adding the shadows between some of the strokes in the highlight so you want to be able to see the texture still otherwise the highlight will look flat still come over the previous and when you get to those spots again extend out toward them so you get the little bit of texture as the spots sort of start and you can even just focus on areas so you can just do strokes through here take your time and really work on those if you feel like you're not getting a lot of control with your pencils your pencil may be a little bit too blunt so just run it through your sharpener really quickly and you'll be able to bring back up the point again. So you always want to try and work on that point for the most control. So it's not a big sharpen, like you shouldn't be losing a lot of pencil. It's literally just refreshing the tip. Now in the lighter areas you are extending out but not over the whole way. So you can add the golden rod to the top of the legs and then just let that color fade a little bit. And then you can bring the beige through in the leg area as well. Now as a last little step, you can grab your white pencil, make sure it's nice and sharp. And you can come in the spots, but you come in between the strokes. So what we're doing is we're brightening, in the, brightening up the space between so the strokes still stand out. We still have texture, but it will lighten our spots up as well. If you have... If you feel like you've lost a little bit of the texture through those areas, don't forget you can come back with the darker colors and just apply on those very edges. It's just about sort of assessing where you feel it's at and adding what you feel it needs because we do all color a little bit differently. We're all going to get a slightly different result here today. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So please make sure that you're not comparing and using mine as the be all and end all with your coloring as well because animals come in all different shapes sizes and colors variation doesn't make them wrong it makes them unique and things that you don't love are things that you can work on and incorporate next time you do a lesson so make sure if something just really didn't work that you ask for help and you say, it's really dark. What did I do wrong? How can I fix this for next time? And this is the sort of stuff that we can work on in your free private tutoring as well. So help you feel more confident with that result so you can keep going too. So don't ever feel like you can't reach out. It's 100% what it's there for to help you troubleshoot those things that maybe you're not quite happy with so you can get the results you want in the end. Now I do just finish up with a little bit of nectar in the cheek and you can even brighten it a little bit with a little touch of carmine as well if you want it even more rosy just dab it through there too. And that is actually our little deer all finished up. So let's zoom out and take a look. Now you've learned so many different techniques in this class. So it's a little mini class, but we've learned all about fur. We've learned about florals, grass, doing that basic sky or background technique. And so many light source and art fundamental techniques for you to take away here today. And that's going to help you color all different images in your stash so remember it's not about the project we've done here today i hope you love the image but it's really not about that this is like an exercise sheet it's a class it's a lesson 
It's your vessel to learn technique, to take away, to apply to your favorite images after class. So remember that if you do ever want to try a class, you need to think about what you actually are learning and taking away, not whether it's your favorite type of image ever, or if you like fantasy, or if you like florals. It's not about that. It's about you making that choice to learn more about coloring and wanting to learn and tackle all different elements and techniques so that when you come to color your favorite image and you may love, say, um, you may have a particular love for bear stamps, bears in cute outfits. So when you come to color up a bear, you go, hmm, he's holding a little flower and I did a flower in that class. So let me just refer back to that book and I can see, okay, light source goes here. This is how I did the color. Oh, I really like that vibrant fuchsia we did. I'm going to incorporate that. So you're going back and you're grabbing out bits that you've learned before. You're exercising your problem skills. You're exercising the, the technique that you grasped a little bit before and you're going over it and repeating it again. And that's what's helping you improve and increase your skill level with your coloring so you can feel more confident after class. Now remember this is your first time trying this technique and when we try new things we can often have mistakes in areas we don't love. It's totally normal. Before looking at your work I want you to do something really important and that's change your perspective. When we're coloring, we color from about 10 or 20 centimeters away. We color so up close, focusing on every single little detail, every mistake, every single little aspect. But that's not actually how coloring is viewed. Think about whenever you're online, you see someone else's work. Do you sit so close and scrutinize looking for mistakes? No, you look at the whole thing. You appreciate it in entirety, how the techniques have come together. That's what we want to do here as well. So to help you change your perspective, what I would encourage you to do is hop up out of your chair, do some hand stretches, just open and close your hands a few times, make sure you're not getting any RSI from holding those pencils, neck gently from side to side, and even do a lap walking around the room just to loosen up. Then when you come back, hold your coloring out at arm's distance or prop it up against the wall and take a few steps back. You're changing that perspective, viewing it as a whole and seeing how it's coming together. Make sure you do those things so you actually get up and do your stretches. It helps so much rather than just holding it back and looking. So when you're looking at your whole piece, remember if there's areas you don't love, instead of saying I've done this wrong or it's not perfect, really don't like when people say that. Try and always avoid it, especially if you're sharing online as well. What I want you to do instead is look at your piece and say, any areas you don't love, think of the lesson here. Next time I'm going to do this to get this result. And see all of a sudden you change negative into positive into constructive. It's your learning opportunity. And that's exactly what we're here to do today. So experiment, have fun with it. You're doing a great job. I'm really excited to see how you're going. Pop in and share your coloring after this step with us. Pop it in our Facebook group. Pop it on Instagram, your blogs, any other group. You're welcome to share any way you like. All I love is that you please just mention that you're learning at Kid and Clouder so others can come and learn with us as well. I'd love if you'd mention what class it is. But you are working hard. You are challenging yourself. You're pushing yourself. That deserves to be celebrated. So again, give yourself a big pat on the back. You've done the most important thing to help you grow your color in here today. Welcome to the Marcus portion of the video tutorial. Now you should have done the start of this chapter where we go through how we're going to tackle the blending. Please make sure that you've done this before jumping in. Now I'm just going to start with the facial features here because it can feel a little bit incomplete, a little bit funny without that being done. So let's go ahead and add that first. Now it is a smaller area. If you're not comfortable with fine lines, you could use a black pencil or even a fine liner for this step. But I'm using my black marker and I'm just coming around the nose. I'm going to aim to leave a little bit of white toward the top of the nose area to show a little bit of high shine. I'm also coming around the mouth as well. And then I'll also come into the eye area. Now you can see the artist has drawn these tiny little white dots. They're the highlights and reflections in the eye. So I want to come around those. You can make them any size that you are comfortable with. Just try and leave that little bit of white there. But if you don't leave it, don't forget you can always grab a white gel pen. 
I've got a uni ball signo here, which is great to use with your markers and you can go over anything as well. If you're not happy with how it ends up, you can grab a black pencil even, and then just sort of shape some of those highlights back a little bit. So they're a little smaller as well. Now I do want to add in some eyelashes that does require me to be a little bit more lighter with my touch. So again, if that's not something you're comfortable with, please just use a pencil or a fine liner, but I'm just working on some little fine lines in here. Okay, I'm going to come in and do the detailing in the ear. So I've got R20. I'm going to do that little pocket in here, creating the little folds of skin and also to either side of the ear there as well. And we can softly blend them out with a little bit of R30. So it's just a nice little peachy color tone. You can even come down, bring back those blacks and grays into the little hoofs as well. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna grab the black marker and I'm gonna come along the outer edge there. And I'm going to aim to leave a little bit of high shine toward the front of each of these. So I'm doing a little bit of dabbing on the side and you can see I've left a bit of white through the center. Now the way our eye sees high shine is through high contrast. So deep dark shadows, versus bright white highlights. That's what helps to show the shine to our eye. So you even wanna leave a little bit of white when you're doing a nice bright highlight as well. So then I grab my W5 and I'm going to come back over the black and I'm just blending in toward that front area. And you can see I'm just leaving a tiny little slither of white. So not a lot, but just a tiny little bit. And that's gonna show that high shine for us. So that's those little details done. Now we're gonna come in and do the contouring. So I'm going to do this a little bit of a tricky way for you here. So remember at the start of the video, we talked about the fact that we're seeing our deer from a bit of a distance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create just a rough texture. We're not going to look at individual strokes and lines here. So the way I'm going to do this is by doing a basic blend. So just like everything we've already been doing, so nothing too fancy. And then we're going to come back and add our texture over the top. So let's start with my darkest color, E37, and I'm just going to apply to all of my shadow areas firstly. So you can see applying to the top of the head, going to come in between the nose where we had that little dip. So everywhere that we talked about at the start of the video, essentially. You know, around the ear, adding the color to the inside of the ear there. bit to the underside of the head. Now we've got the shadow underneath the head onto the neck here. So we're going to use that little bit of shading there. Now we talked about the muscle definition earlier as well. So this is going to come from the back of the head toward that front leg there just because that's the direction he's sort of turning in. And I'm going to add the shading toward the front from that little tiny bit of shading on the inside of the head just because that is again still in front and you get a little bit of a dip there where that strongest contour is going to come around the legs so again the legs sitting in front of the rest of the body so we'd have the shading around that just bring this up as well you can see really shaping the leg as it comes up and then we can extend back toward where that muscle is. So the neck, usually that will run the whole way through, but we don't need to connect it here. We're just adding the darkest color in those very shadow points to begin with. Coming into the back here now. Adding the color where that dip is. Now where you get these little dots, just come around them for now. We don't need to worry about being super neat. We've got a little bit of messiness with our animals. Always helps them to look a little bit more natural as well. 
they're not out there giving themselves a good brush so we can have a little bit of roughness for a more natural look. Now coming into the rear here, now I want the, the very butt to be white. So I'm gonna leave a little gap and I'm going to do some strokes extending down. So you can see, leaving a gap between. It's messy, it's quick. Don't worry about perfection here. Into the knee, same thing. Some messy, rough little strokes on that end before you start to blend it up. Come on the other side of the leg. Now I want the belly to be nice and light. So I'm gonna come around and I'm going to shape that up a little higher from where the belly ends. Same on this side as well. So bring that up sort of in line and that's where you're shaping the underside of that fur. You're doing the cast shadow behind the legs there. So we're adding the shading on the body with the legs being in front. Now we do have some of the legs behind. I want the legs to overall be a little lighter. So I'm keeping my shadow just sort of toward the front, showing that's sort of like the front of the leg there. That's going to be that darker color of the fur. Same on the side as well. And then we can also do a little bit of definition in this front leg, just where those muscles would be. But I'm leaving the bottom legs nice and light here because I want them to be just a lighter value of the blend overall. All right, that's the darkest color all done. You can see a lot of contouring already, a lot of that light source that we've been talking about throughout. Let's continue to blend. So the next color I'm gonna be using now is E35. So straight over the top and extending a little further. Now I'm not wasting a lot of time getting the blend smooth. You don't need to do that here because we want texture. So don't worry about neatness, don't worry about smoothness, just worry about getting the color down and thinking about that light source instead. Using that muscle definition in the neck there. Now coming around that leg. Okay, so you can see starting to flesh it out. We're slowly getting there. E33 is next, and we're just doing the same thing. So we're just coming over the top and slowly starting to blend out. Coming around any of those spots when I get close to them. It's just a basic blend at the moment, nothing fancy. Now 
Next color in the blend is E31. Now this is one of my main colors in the blend. So I'm going to be extending this a little further now. So I'm coming around the eye area. I'm starting to shape that out where we're going to leave that little bit of white there. And then adding into the sides. Not bringing over the whole area though, so I'm still leaving space for my lighter colors. But you can see definitely adding more of it as I come through the body area here. Coming in and around those little spots, it's okay if you get some color on the spots. Because what happens is we want to still remember the spots are part of the fur. So when the fur is joining in, think of it like this. So you've got like the white and you've got the brown and the fur still overlaps. So we're still going to have bits of brown coming into the white where that fur is overlapping and building up. Now, with this color, I'm going to come down now into the legs, so extending our contouring down further and adding a bit of shading up from the base. So this is what I was talking about before. We're leaving off our darker colors so we can help these areas look a little lighter. Now the next color in the blend is a little bit of YR23. So what I'm aiming to do with this color is not so much blend from dark to light, but to tone the color blend. So we've talked about that in this class already. It's adding a little bit of like a yellow base to the blend. Otherwise the blend here was getting a little bit gray. So we just come over all of the previous and then extend a little further out to my highlights again. So it just changes that underlying tone of the blend. It injects a little bit of the yellow, which is more true to the deer color tone in real life. Now I'm applying this pretty messily. Again, I'm not so focused on my uh, color being perfect on the page here. You can see sometimes applying with messy strokes. It's helping me build up that texture underneath that basic blend. Coming into the legs and the same thing, we'll just come over what we did previously and then extend a little further. All right, and then my last color is Y21. So this is again, a softer yellow tone. So it's helping us to add a little bit more of that yellow to the blend rather than just being the brown. So we're creating the tone of color rather than just blending from light to dark. Now don't worry if after adding this color, it looks a little funny. We haven't been smooth with our blend. We're just laying down color for contouring. That's all we're doing. So it's not going to look finished because it's not. We've still got steps to go before we finish up the fur. But you should be able to basically take a step back and have a look at what you've done and be able to see all of the basic contouring. So if I look here, we can see light and shade. This is still a good blend. Like you can see there on the page, you've still got depth. We can still see everything that we're intending, the light, the shade, the textures. 
So now but what we want to come and do is we want to add that fur texture over the top. So this is our base. The hard work is done. All we're doing now is adding texture. And it's very similar to how we did our grass at the bottom. So I grab the marker, I hold it nice and close to the nib and I'm going to be working on the tip. So you want your marker to look vertical in your hand and you're literally just rubbing the nib over the paper. I'm not drawing, I'm just doing little flicks and I'm just barely moving my hand back and forth. The key here, the absolute key is not how fine your strokes are. Please, if you can leave with anything today, remember whenever you do uh, fur or hair, I do not care how thin your strokes are. You should not care how thin they are. What you need to focus on is separating your strokes, just like I've shown right here. The separation is the key to creating texture, not how fine the strokes are. So many people focus so much on how fine the strokes are, and sometimes it's too fine and we don't have good texture or messiness really on the page. And what I often see when people are so focused on fine is I see this. Now, can you see what the problem is? My strokes are really, really fine there. But when I finished, what does it look like? It looks like a basic blend because I have no space between those fine strokes. So it didn't matter how fine I got that, it still ended up looking thick and chunky and like I didn't have the texture there because I wasn't thinking about spacing. If you have thick strokes but you're spacing them out, you're still going to get texture. So you're still going to have all that texture behind you to be able to see what it is you're trying to communicate. Fine lines comes with time and practice because it's a control thing with your markers. It's not something that anyone's just amazing at off the bat. You've got to be able to put in repetitive practice. And this is why if you struggle with hair or fur, actively choosing to do the classes that go over that practice is going to help you get there faster because you're exercising those skills over and over. You're going over what I'm saying over and over. It's going to make more sense. So that's why getting the actual practice in is going to make it easier for you. But I just really want you to remember today that don't focus on how fine your strokes are, but let's focus just on making sure we've got texture here today by separating. So let's jump in and have a go. I've got the E37 and I literally start in the shadow. So just do what you did before, add in a little shadow and then you're doing just your strokes and I've just got little gaps between them. I'm just barely rubbing my marker on the page so I can see those strokes. It's not super noticeable because remember, we're not aiming to draw individual lines here. We're aiming just to indicate a little bit of roughness, a little bit of texture in our animal that's at distance to us. So I'm just adding strokes down on the paper and leaving gaps between them. That's all I'm doing. When you get to the little white um, spots, you just stop your strokes. So you just blend into them. That's it, so it's not too fancy there. But I'm just literally following and adding in some strokes where I did all of the darker color in my previous step. So it shouldn't be too difficult. You're using the colors underneath as a base. It doesn't matter how neat your strokes are. I'd rather you have a little bit of messiness here because it's going to look more natural in the end. What's really important is that you're not judging this halfway through because it's always going to feel messy. Hair, fur, skin, those sort of techniques, they always really look incomplete until you come in with the very last color because you need to see how that draws everything together. Halfway, it just feels a little bit wrong, unfortunately. So just trust the process here with it. That's my best advice. Okay, so that's the darkest color done. I'm going to come back with the next one. It's E35. Straight over the top, and you can see I'm just starting in those shadow areas, applying the strokes straight over the E37, and then just extending further. That's all I'm doing. So like I said, once you've added in all that contouring with the previous steps, it's so easy because you're just 
basically laying down color exactly where you already have. Nothing new is really happening on the page. You're just adding texture over the top. Now again, when you get to these little spots, take the time to be able to draw in your strokes so you can come between them. Again, it doesn't need to be perfect. If you get color in them, it's absolutely okay. But we do want to actually see those individual strokes where your spots are sort of starting to indicate that they're textured as well. A33 is next, and we're just doing the same thing. So you're just coming through from the shadow area, and the strokes just get a little further out. Again, don't worry about how neat they are, but follow the direction, shapes, and contouring that you have done previously. You can go over the previous and you can see I'm just extending into those white spots as well. So if you go over the previous areas, you'll be able to soften down the strokes a little bit. But I'm not trying to lay the strokes directly on top of what I've done before. Some strokes will sit beside, some will sit on top. There's not really a real formula. It's just more that you're following all those shapes and directions that you did before. Next color, E31, same thing, now this color nice and light, so extending it up a lot further now.
Y on 23, and the same thing. Now this color is going to come through the whole area now. So pay special attention to the strokes as you come into those white spots as well. Because if we were to come over everything with our lightest color, we wouldn't really see that lightest color. But make sure, even when you're using this YR23, that those strokes are spaced. That is the key, not how fine your strokes are. So please, please, please remember that. Now you can come in with your Y21 and just focus on the little strokes where the spots are. So basically what you're doing is you're just softening where those strokes are kind of ending and the white kind of is. So you're not just leaving the spots white, it's like you've got that texture coming into them as well. So we're always indicating that white's not just white and nothing's happening. White's still textured, it's still fur, it's still got that movement. And what you can even do is you can even bring in your colorless blender and the blender is not a blender. So blender strips color away. Like we talked about when we did that background. So remember if we're stripping color away, we can use this to create resist effects. So I can even come into the spots and I can go back and forth on an area and create strokes. So if I've got too much color through there, I can apply this and create some strokes over those spots. So this is a really good little tip as well. So I like to actually come between strokes with this color. So I go back and forth, back and forth, and I make the white space between them even brighter. So that makes the darker lines stand out. It creates a bit more texture. Of course, it's optional. If you're happy with where you're at, just leave it. You don't need to come in with the blender, but it can help just to enhance a few areas. And of course, only if you feel comfortable. You can finish with a little bit of blush to the cheek as well. And I like to just grab R20 and I just dab it through there. And you can dab your R30 over the top as well, which will just fade it into the rest of your shading. And that, if we zoom out, is actually our dear all finished up. Now you've learned so many different techniques in this class. So it's a little mini class, but we've learned all about fur. We've learned about florals, grass, doing that basic sky or background technique. And so many light source and art fundamental techniques for you to take away here today. And that's going to help you color all different images in your stash. So remember, it's not about the project we've done here today. I hope you love the image. But it's really not about that. This is like an exercise sheet. It's a class. It's a lesson. It's your vessel to learn technique, to take away, to apply to your favorite images after class. So remember that if you do ever want to try a class, you need to think about what you actually are learning and taking away, not whether it's your favorite type of image ever, or if you like fantasy, or if you like florals. It's not about that. It's about you making that choice to learn more about coloring and wanting to learn and tackle all different elements and techniques so that when you come to color your favorite image and you may love, say, um, you may have a particular love for bear stamps, bears in cute outfits. So when you come to color up a bear, you go, hmm, he's holding a little flower and I did a flower in that class. So let me just refer back to that book and I can see, okay, light source goes here. This is how I did the color. Oh, I really like that vibrant fuchsia we did. I'm going to incorporate that. So you're going back and you're grabbing out bits that you've learned before. You're exercising your problem skills. You're exercising the, the technique that you grasped a little bit before and you're going over it and repeating it again. And that's what's helping you improve and increase your skill level with your coloring so you can feel more confident after class.
Now, remember, this is your first time trying this technique, and when we try new things, we can often have mistakes in areas we don't love. It's totally normal. Before looking at your work, I want you to do something really important, and that's change your perspective. When we're coloring, we color from about 10 or 20 centimeters away. We color so up close, focusing on every single little detail, every mistake, every single little aspect. But that's not actually how coloring is viewed. Think about whenever you're online, you see someone else's work. Do you sit so close and scrutinize looking for mistakes? No, you look at the whole thing. You appreciate it in entirety, how the techniques have come together. That's what we want to do here as well. So to help you change your perspective, what I would encourage you to do is hop up out of your chair, do some hand stretches, just open and close your hands a few times, make sure you're not getting any RSI from holding those pencils, neck gently from side to side, and even do a lap walking around the room just to loosen up. Then when you come back, hold your coloring out at arm's distance or prop it up against the wall and take a few steps back. You're changing that perspective, viewing it as a whole and seeing how it's coming together. Make sure you do those things so you actually get up and do your stretches. It helps so much rather than just holding it back and looking. So when you're looking at your whole piece, remember if there's areas you don't love, instead of saying I've done this wrong or it's not perfect, really don't like when people say that. Try and always avoid it, especially if you're sharing online as well. What I want you to do instead is look at your piece and say, any areas you don't love, think of the lesson here. Next time, I'm going to do this to get this result. And see, all of a sudden, you change negative into positive into constructive. It's your learning opportunity, and that's exactly what we're here to do today. So experiment, have fun with it. You're doing a great job. I'm really excited to see how you're going. Pop in and share your coloring after this step with us. Pop it in our Facebook group. Pop it on Instagram, your blogs, any other group. You're welcome to share any way you like. All I love is that you please just mention that you're learning at Kid and Clouder so others can come and learn with us as well. I'd love if you mentioned what class it is. But you are working hard. You are challenging yourself. You're pushing yourself. That deserves to be celebrated. So again, give yourself a big pat on the back. You've done the most important thing to help you grow your coloring here today.